it's e as easy as that. That's how hard it yeah. is. It's technology, hey? It is pretty cool. Um, I, I've been playing around, I use Team Zoom, FaceTime, I've been playing around with different technologies. What I like to see is um, something with some sort of audio uh, interface there, that, or, uh, you know, read out so you can hear how loud you are, you know, like. Uh, yeah. Uh, I kind of struggle with that a little bit for the first few times I've done this, but um, I don't know. Zoom's easy though. And it's uh, easy to edit things out with Zoom. And um, I don't know, it's just, it's easy to, to grab the files and just, I throw them into GarageBand and I process them and then yeah, take them out to the internet. So, so yeah, so it's a beautiful day where you are today. It is lovely, not a cloud in the sky, not a yeah. single, oh, there's a few over there, but nothing, <laughs> nothing significant. Uh, summer's on its way here. I think it's going to be, you know, 27 or 28 degrees here today, which is very mild. Uh, yeah. You're in Perth, Australia, West Australia. That's right. Is there a, like a silly nickname for West Australians or anything like that? Like there's silly nicknames for everything in Australia. Yeah, we're called sand gropers here. <laughs> I didn't know and that. It's just, look, look it up online. It's this. It's, it's like a. It's an insect that crawl that like buries through the sand. It's about this oh, big. Oh, okay. Yeah. They're pretty gross looking. Uh, I, I don't. I, I should have been prepared with something like that. I could have had a printout or something. I could have <laughs> held up for you. Um, but yeah, sand gropers is what we're okay. uh, what we're called over here. I didn't know that. That's hilarious. Yeah. So you are, and I'm in Saskatoon. So it's Friday night for me. And yeah, have a long week, and, and your Saturday morning, it's start of the morning. So yeah. what's it like there in the future? Because you're seeing what's uh, the next day like for you? Yeah, October look, 17th, am I expecting anything bad at all? I haven't seen any bad news yet. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, the trend will continue. Uh, the future is pretty much like the present and the past. It's just what it is. So. so how long did it take for you to get sick of that stupid joke where people making that kind of a joke where you're a year ahead? <laughs> yeah, I still, I still get a kick out of it. You know what? It's, it's, it's a total dad joke. <laughs> it is, but you know, there's, it's along the same lines as the ones you hear all the time anyway over here. Like, Oh, yeah. you know, um, uh, you know, you don't get, you don't get angry when someone thinks you're American, do you? And it's like, well, you know, I've now lived outside of us outside of Canada since It'll be at the end of the month. It'll be 19 years since I left. Holy Canada. cow! So, yeah, October 31st, 2001. So yeah, you know, I, I've lived for the the practical part of my life. Other when I was a small child, I've lived out of Canada half my life now. So um, yeah, it's it's just it's it's a standard thing. People do, people think they're being funny, I guess, and <laughs> I still get a kick out of it. Well, you can put up with me because I haven't seen you forever. So that's <laughs> yeah. I was actually thinking back to the last time we caught up. I was thinking it's my six or seven years ago. We went for yeah. wings at Fox and Hounds. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I haven't really seen. Well, I haven't seen a lot of those guys. Well, let's see a few of them here. I see that some of those guys are around here and there. I suppose, but um, yeah, that was a nice night. It was really nice to see you. And uh, I, mean, back, well, I was back in Saskatoon, Saskatoon for a few years by that point. Yeah. But uh, now I'm an old veteran here back in Saskatoon. Because you went out to Calgary pretty much after finished uni, didn't you? Sure did. There for seven or eight years. And uh, with everybody else. Like so many people went to Calgary. And then yeah. coming back, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of people there. Like I was in engineering, so like everybody went to Calgary. Yeah. So, and... Um, uh, there's a few people that came that stayed and there's been a couple that have come back as well too, which is kind of cool to see those people too. So yeah. In my close group of friends, uh, Mason Douglas is probably the, the number one guy who went out to Calgary and then decided for lifestyle reasons that Saskatoon was the place to be. Uh, yeah. I, I get that. Uh, the only thing for me would be, it would be a struggle now having not experienced a proper winter in half my life to go back to the the indoor nature of of a saskatoon winter just being trapped inside for so much of it it's just like covid that's what happened with covid you just stay inside all day yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah no it, it really it's uh you have to have a you have to have a reason to go outside and so you have to push yourself to have activities 
Like, so my kid plays hockey, and so that's cool. Okay. So I can coach him and get yeah. me out to the rink. Did you hear from Dar- Darren Mitchell? I saw Mitchell yesterday. No, I, I text him every now and then. Okay. I love those guys, but I'm the one who makes the effort to get in touch. You know, like during yeah. the early part of lockdowns there in Canada, we were doing like exactly like this around this time. We were doing uh, like a Zoom drinks. So it was oh, yeah. Mitchell, <laughs> Jeff Gerhardt, Mason, yeah. uh, Chad Blash, Scott Herndier, and there was a oh, number Scotty. of us that were getting together. Yeah. Uh, but it really, it faded out pretty quickly. <laughs> Yeah, it's just not the same as catching up. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. I, I do like the again the technology and being able to see people face to face. Um, <clears throat> remember Staples, Greg Staples, good friend of mine. He yep. they reached out to me like within a few weeks of that happening, and we FaceTimed. It was so good. Felt like you didn't think he, how you forgot how much you missed that kind of stuff. So so now we're able to do that. So that's well, that was sort of my thought pattern with doing this podcast was to continue that because I had some really great talks to some people this way which maybe you don't do on the phone you certainly don't do on text or Facebook so um yeah it's really nice to but to do that but you have to make the effort to do that and I like I don't mind telling people like let's set a time in fact good friend of mine from university um I haven't talked to her in like 10 years and we just connected on teams during work like a noon hour we do once a month now we just actually talk Let's let's get catch up because we used to go for lunch all the time and that's what we would do. So now we're gonna sit there. It's in my work calendar. I just schedule it in, and yeah. we we sit around at lunchtime and we just talk for an hour. Um, yeah, awesome. It is pretty good. I just mentioned Mitchell though because he he's coaching hockey as well, and his kid is my kid's age. Oh, okay. So he was he was right after me, and so we're do, going in the rinks, and it's stupid because you have to walk in with your mask on put your skates on kids are already dressed so you put yeah. their skates on you throw them on the ice didn't take your mask off and you're playing with the kids and it's like <laughs> i have no idea <laughs> why we're doing any of this stuff at all like we, but, you know it, it's whatever. crazy when i hear about it because our the west australian government closed our our interstate border very quickly We've had, yeah. I think we're, we're well over a hundred days now of no community transmission. The virus has essentially been eliminated here. So okay. with the exception of a few minor restrictions, we're back to a, like, it's like, it's not happening here, which is very, very strange because it's not impact. It, I mean, it had a terrible impact. I'm sure we'll talk about business later on how to, it's, and it's going to yeah. have an enduring impact on my business and businesses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but in terms of my, my life, my personal life, it's not, it's not even a factor at the moment. But when I, when I speak to my mom who lives in Southern Ontario and, you know, speak to my, my dad and his partner who are there in Saskatoon, like it's not actually crazy there, but they're still having to be a lot more careful uh, and do things that I don't even have to think about. I've got a mask somewhere around here yeah. uh, and I used it during the initial period, but, uh, my you know, we're right at here. No... Calgary flames. flames mask. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> mask all over the house that's what it is yeah. yeah yeah that's i did not know that about um closing the borders for that long and has there been like are, are people able to travel and quarantine or they, they literally don't allow travel at all or, or you you can you can travel uh but you have to quarantine uh and even traveling from one state to another here unless you have an exemption for something so i had to go to a funeral uh, a couple of weeks ago mm-hmm. and People came in from outside of Western Australia and at the funeral. They were allowed to be there, but they had to be appropriately social distanced and wear a mask okay. um, when they were at the funeral. And then they had to, they were allowed to isolate in a, it wasn't at a hotel, but they had to be at home. So actually during uh, a little bit oh. of a, a service after the, uh, the funeral itself back at uh, one of the people's houses, the cops actually turned up to check on one of the guys uh, who had come out into the state. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, it's, I guess, allowed a huge section of our economy to reopen, particularly hospitality is going. If you want to bar a restaurant right now yeah. here, you're sweet. It's coming into summertime. It's the outdoor patio season. People can't go anywhere. So guess what they're spending money on? Booze and food. So, yeah. it's, you know, uh, it would be a good timing. And, and it's exactly opposite in other places around it Australia. Is, it is, yeah. I went out for dinner last night or the night before, a really nice restaurant. It's half 
full allowed or whatever it is and it's like there's hardly anybody there and you just yeah. feel for these people right and so like you give a big tip and but holy shit i just so many restaurants are going out of business this this uh this time here so yeah it's that's that's crazy to hear that it's so surreal how that all works but you have the advantage that you're not next to a 300 million person super you know superpower that's right with the longest undefended border in the world yeah it's very difficult to and we're actually a lot closer to europe too and it's um yeah like i know you're pretty close to say southeast asia but at least you have an yeah, ocean yeah. there that's exactly it. I mean, I, I, when I, whenever I talk to my mom, she lives in Windsor and her apartment literally looks across the river to Detroit. Like, you know, she opens yeah. her windows every day and to imagine that that bit of water that, you know, most people who are competent at swimming could probably swim across. <laughs> but that's really all that divides, you know, where it's, you know, it's nuts in the U S at the moment. Uh, uh, you know, it's nuts in Ontario and Quebec too, though. Like, yeah. You know, we look at the states, but it's not much better in those uh, places as well, too. Like out west isn't as bad, and Atlanta, Canada, is hardly anybody there. But yeah, um, yeah, it's it's I don't know, America. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> God bless her. <laughs> yeah, It'll be interesting to see what happens in the next couple of weeks after the election and everything. Uh, oh, well, one way or the other, hopefully things will just settle down. Hopefully it'll just. I can't. Uh, my my. Uh, I've had so to take a bit of a all. break from from news consumption. I'm a, I'm a me too. I consider myself to be a world citizen. I've traveled a lot. I have. I'm involved in tourism, which is connected to points all over the globe. Um, and so I, I want to know what's going on. But I've really had to scale back because yeah. it, it stresses me out. It makes me nervous. And you know, for for friends, for colleagues, for family, for you know, just just the the I guess the the calm and normal life that I'm used to. I mean, lived, you know, half my life in Canada, a brief period traveling and in the UK and then living here, yeah. you know, yeah. things are generally nice and nice and even. There's some bumps in the road, but it's not wild swings. Social disruption, like, man. That's what's going on. Social disruption, you know, and that's what the internet age brought us. And people, that's, that's what's going on in my mind. Cause, because otherwise social disruption used to occur like, you know, locally or regionally but you never saw yeah. it on this global scale and it's because communication is like this fast and people try to make sense out of it and then they immediately react and they divide things up they categorize things and people and situations to the certain categories and they pick their teams and boom that's it yeah and uh that's why i'm doing this right uh, the only way out of that kind of stuff is actually talking to people and exactly Listening and listen, to people. And, and listen, yeah. Probably talking is a good one, but probably starting with the listening first. <laughs> just trying to understand people's points of view and other things as well. Because, you know, quite often now, particularly because we are, we are the broadcast generation, like who would have thought, you know, when, we, you know, 20 years ago that we'd be making, you know, something that could be available to everyone around the planet in the, you know, by the time you edit it and throw it up online, you know, yeah. like pushing everyone's pushing stuff out there how many people are actually sitting around and absorbing things that other people are saying yeah i like with my podcast it's great because I, I publish them i publish them but then i listen to them like seven or eight times because i just love because i miss a lot that's another thing too when you have these conversations with you i'm gonna be talking to you but i'm also like thinking about stuff and, and hearing yeah. you and and then you're trying to think of the next thing to talk about and then, so when I listen to it again, or now I'm starting to put them on YouTube. So when I uh, watch them again, I'm, oh, I missed that. Or the person was talking about this. And I, I totally did not understand what they were saying, or I, I didn't quite get it. Right. And you can tell it cause I'm going off like this and you can see me thinking. <laughs> yeah. So that's listening and listening is hard. And you think I'm sitting here listening and I, I like to think I am, but we're only picking up, um, a certain percentage of what we're saying and what we're meaning and then our you know our visual cues you know the the translate out certain months but you have to reinterpret it yourself and then you're projecting yeah. on them what you think they're saying as well too or maybe what the point is and uh it's very 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 complex and if we take people what they're saying at these tiny little sound bites or little clips of video they go yeah. viral 
We don't, we don't know. Oh, it's on video. Well, yeah, but you don't know. You don't know the context. You don't know the other side. You don't know what led up to it. Yeah. You don't know why sometimes. And uh, like we're killing ourselves because we're just doing that stuff. And so anyways, yeah, like, this is my solution. Okay. I like we're going to be going really deep today now that we've uh, opened up with that, uh, that little bit there, which is awesome. Let's step back then. Let's let's go back and provide some context for people here. So yeah. I've known you since uh, your first year of university in Saskatoon. Yeah. So I was a year ahead of you in school. But we did not study the same thing. We knew each other from university residents. That's right. And still like a huge number of my contacts, acquaintances come from that that shared experience of living on top of or in the yeah. same room or eating with or, you know, partying Drink with, with yeah. uh, <laughs> drinking with, as it was a big one, uh, with th those people. Uh, and, you know, lifelong friendships, I, I guess that's why, you know, people yeah. do it, uh, is, yeah, that you do get these lifelong connections that can uh, bridge 20 years worth of not hanging out and you have this shared experience together. It was amazing. And, you know, um, some of the things I think about that we did, you know, together, uh, I think it was maybe about a year ago, I dug out those photos when you, you had, I don't know, you had the keys to something and we got all the trophies from all the res trophies and we posed with like every single trophy and cop and everything, like we won everything. And it was like, you know, just a random night, but because you had the key to the cabinet, we just, we just had our own photo shoot. Like we yeah. won everything. Yeah, I had a lot of pole and res at that time. Yeah. <laughs> Christ, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, I imagine like guys like like especially my first year guys like like still tight with those guys. Like even like even if I don't see them forever, it's like you know I talked to Brady Pollock, you know, uh, yeah. the other day and or a few weeks ago, and I haven't talked to him forever. And he just I gave him a call. I actually had a work thing to do because he works for the Saskatchewan government. I gave him a call. Ask him some questions yeah. and uh, hit it right off. That's just where we do. We're just that's we're the same guys, you know, like we're a little more, a little older and a little more refined than we used to be, but um, never changes, you know. You know, Scotty Alberts, you know, yeah, you know, it, have you I, spoken to him? Have you spoken to him recently? Five years ago, which is recently okay. for me. Uh, I need to reach out. He's a guy who I, I think about quite regularly, uh, and there's a few who, again, like. Uh, my wife always says I'm very good at reaching out and keeping in touch with people, but there's also a limit because you also want those interactions to be meaningful for you and for the other person. So if you spread yourself yeah. too thin, they can become a little bit more superficial than, than a proper catch up. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah so like something like this is kind of cool because it's an occasion and we can kind of prepare for it. Yeah. Get ready for it. Get excited about it. I was pumped. Like just texting you. Ready to go, yeah. man. Yeah. Uh, I was racking my brain to try and think of, you know, some like funny anecdotes or, you know, something that, you know, we did or you and I did together or whatever. One of the ones that, that I came up with, which again, it was more me directed <laughs> at you. We had a bit of jokey stuff going on between our group in res where, you know, it was minor, not destructive, practical joking, but, you know, it was... They, they were fun things and you might get upset about it, but it never really lasted. We took, what was the name of the campus paper? What was it called? Uh, the the Sheaf. The, the Sheaf. Yeah. So we went down to Louis and grabbed, cause they just, um, you know, put them out in the little stands. Yeah. I can't remember who I did it with, but we went down and grabbed as many sheaves as we could. And yeah. somehow I think you left your door ajar. Always, always yeah. left my door open. Yeah. Yeah. And so we went and crumpled up like, 500 issues of the sheaf and filled your room yeah. to uh, at least six feet above the ground filled with newspaper. And the no. closet was filled and my drawers. Yeah. So all my clothes felt like so you know, greasy is what it felt like. Everything just greasy in the curtains. <laughs> and, and I was like, fuck you guys. I probably should apologize <laughs> for that if I didn't do it originally because it was, you know, uh, super inconsiderate, but it was hilarious at the time. <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> you sons of bitches. Well, I started locking my door a bit more too. But. Yeah. Well, I guess it was, yeah. So it's, it's about teaching you a lesson, right? Well, I usually just left the door open and then to play music for everybody. <laughs> then I'd walk out. So when yeah. you blast my beastie boys or whatever it is, I just like 
let her rip as I <laughs> and I go to class. <laughs> yeah. Doing everyone a favor. That's what I did. Come on, people. Yeah. Oh, hey. And music was a big part of living in res. Uh, oh, yeah. You know, everyone's different styles. You know what? I, I was coming from uh, Regina. Yes. You know, we had, uh, we obviously had, you know, um, it was less like sort of country music focus more, you know, at that time with the nineties explosion of hip hop yeah. and other things like that. And there was a real mix and you come to res with, you know, like <laughs> loose lands, not particularly big place, you know? Uh, and there were a lot of people from a lot of small towns. Right. So there was that real mix of, you know, and I have to say, I certainly don't listen to country music uh, by choice now, nope, uh, but you know, there are tunes when they come on or I hear them that it's like, it, it has a, an emotional connection to, uh, to, to university, to res or to events. Like uh, what was the big, there's a big agricultural. Egg bag drag. Uh, egg yeah, bag drag. Yeah. 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 And We're, just, Oh, let's talk about egg bag drag. Cause that's your agriculture dance, right? And the yeah. idea, stupid idea, like, you know, well, I'm like, you, it has to be one guy there and a girl. <clears throat> Girls can go by themselves. Guys can have to go by themselves. You had to take somebody there. So yeah. it was really cool because they had a really nice balance uh, in the room. And basically the, the deal was you walk in and you throw beer on the person beside you. That was basically yeah. it. I don't think it got more sophisticated no. than that. I remember walking in one time. I, I had I was drinking all day at the the pre party because that's what you do, and then yeah. I walk in. I had like twenty bucks, so I could buy like four drinks or whatever it is. And I remember I got a drink, turn around, some girl threw it in my face. I turn around, because I'm still in the front of the line. Turn around, got another beer, threw it in her face. And then I turn around, got another beer, downed it, and then I grabbed the beer and just walked around. I remember doing that, and I lost my shoes that night, too. So I was walking around on campus, soaking wet. With, it with with sock soaking wet socked feet i don't know where my shoes were i have no idea i don't remember taking them off i didn't know why i was walking around on campus like that i don't know where i was i think i must have got dropped off at the engineering building or something like that because i was in res right yeah but that's a big drag man like yeah they play a lot of country that's just what you do man yeah and, and it's a product of being in in saskatchewan you know very rural and farming community and not being from a farm myself you know right. being a city city boy um it was a i guess a, a real uh connection to that to that lifestyle and going home to many of my friends uh you know farms on long weekends or thanksgiving or other things like that really opened my eyes to uh you know the i guess the agricultural pursuits of people in in saskatchewan whether they were you know farming lentils or other things it was it's just you so even though you know there's that clear board both in Regina and Saskatoon like you know you cross that threshold and suddenly you're in farm territory uh you know even though you live in the city it's it, it is really separated mm -hmm. sort of a, div a, a huge divide uh here it's you know there's actually areas here not the way they look but you know western Australia is actually quite similar to Saskatchewan it's huge you know it's about two-thirds of uh, or about a third of the entire um australian mm -hmm. continent uh i mean and we we go from you know, sort of a mediterranean climate all the way up to a tropical subtropical and then tropical climate so i mean they grow mangoes in the north and we grow avocados and carrots in the south and so there is a big sure. agricultural thing here we have an area called the wheat belt and it's not dissimilar to saskatchewan except it's rolling gradual hills rather than that completely flat landscape of southern yeah. saskatchewan yeah 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 for sure that's that's kind of a cool thinking about that too because you come back from again an agricultural province like that um what i liked about res was no matter where what your background was nobody cared um, yeah. and i when i went out e when i was doing my student politics stuff and i went out east and visited the universities there and these huge national student conferences. A lot of the complaints for people from say McGill, Queens, even Dalhousie a little bit and those kind of places was like, there's class structures. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, what the hell do you mean? You know, there's, there's class structures in there. It's very evident there and we're trying to bridge the gaps and never saw that in, in Saskatchewan, never. I don't no. care how poor or rich you are. There's some really guys with, whose parents had a lot of, a lot of coin and you would never know it and even yeah. if you knew it you didn't care so that egalitarian sort of uh, 
point of view was pretty good. It's, it was like, are you a good dude or not? That was it. Yeah. That's how you classify people. So I think we were quite lucky as well. Uh, you know, res, res in university was a leveler, you know, it wasn't expensive to go to school. No. Um, and so everyone was, you know, and even if you were extremely rich or not well off, the bulk of people, you know, I would say there was probably a 10% at the top and a 10% at the bottom, but everyone else, we were very middle class, like everyone yeah. was firmly in the middle. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, there wasn't a lot of room, like, what were you going to, what were you going to tell people about, you know, your amazing life that was going to separate you from, from somebody else? It was, it was just the way things were. I don't know if it's a lot different because when I come back to Saskatchewan now, um, you know, I'm in a little, I'm essentially in a little bubble. It's family yeah. and my friends and their families. I'm not going out to, to bars and, you know, doing crazy stuff anymore. It's just, it's mostly family time, you know, right. hanging out at home and stuff. So, um, uh, yeah, I guess the only thing that I really noticed about the difference in, uh, Saskatchewan is it's a lot more multicultural, uh, than it was. Yeah. Uh, and you know, when I left, it was starting to grow. Starting there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's amazing now to come back and see how multicultural how multicultural it is. Yeah, most of my kids, like my kids, go to a Catholic school on the west side, and uh, for French immersion. So there's actually a lot of oh, yeah. uh, new Canadians that are in that school. So we have a lot of a lot of Filipinos, um, yeah. kids from Africa. You see yeah. them more and more, um, uh, and Chinese kids. That's kind of the big three non-white people we kind of see in this class and my kids are growing up in that like you know he's a minority now <laughs> in his class and i don't see anything well, I guess that's, he, I doesn't mean, th he doesn't think anything of it so i don't so. No. and and you know the funny thing is when you grow up in a in a western predominantly anglo country yeah that's just the lifestyle you're used to having traveled extensively through south america and you know through asia uh being having been to africa when it's swapped around you know, it's just, it's just exactly the opposite. You know, mm. you can you literally put yourselves into the shoes of somebody who moves from Africa to Canada. Cause you can, you can imagine sometimes yeah. it's, it's different. Sometimes it's confronting. Sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes people make assumptions about you. You know, yeah. I still remember traveling with um, uh, my partner at the time through South America. Um, she was blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, I looked probably not dissimilar to the way I look now because I didn't shave for a whole year when I was there. I had this wild beard and <laughs> things like that. And even yeah. though um, yeah. she probably spoke Spanish better better than me, you know, anytime we went somewhere, it was like she would try and then they would start talking to me. Right. They just assumed that I was the one, right? They made an <laughs> assumption that because I had dark hair, darker skin, yeah. you know, that I looked like I was maybe you know, Argentinian or, or whatever. And, yeah. uh, you know, it became frustrating for her, uh, so much so that, you know, she sort of gave up at a certain point, like not permanently, but just was like, <laughs> well, through this, they're going to talk to you. I'll just shut up and, and you can yeah. do the talking. I never thought of that, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. I don't think about that kind of stuff because I'm in my little bubble here in Saskatoon and I'm so pale and white from all the, uh, staying indoors all the time. Okay, let's back it up a bit. So you're from Regina. Were you born in Regina or where are you from? No, I'm born in Ottawa. No, Ottawa. Okay. Yeah. Uh, spent the first couple of years of my life in Ottawa. My dad worked for the federal government. Uh, okay. And then uh, my dad's been in, I like straight out of the university, uh, like in the 60s, was in the, you know, one of the early IT sort of guys. Uh, okay. So started in government and then moved into the oil business. So we moved to Calgary in 19... 81 i think so i was like four years old okay uh and we spent most of our most of my childhood was in calgary oh i didn't know uh, that huh. yeah my dad worked at petro canada mm -hmm. uh all the way through to the 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 oil collapse uh, and at that point uh he got an option where it was like get get made redundant and you know get laid off or take a posting somewhere overseas with you know somewhere that with one of petro canada's partners uh, and so he ended up going to Columbia to work for Echo Patrol uh, for a year. Holy cow. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, we didn't go. Um, my family, the rest of our family, we didn't go. Because my older brother, um, Robert, uh, is autistic. 
and mm. <clears throat> the services that are, were available in Colombia at that time uh, were not the same. My brother, when we lived in Calgary, had like, you know, amazing, like went to school. Oh, really? Like, yeah. yeah, boarding school Monday to Friday uh, okay. and then came home on the weekends and it was highly specialized to look after his needs. And yeah. they would have had to give all that up for us to go uh, to Columbia. Yeah. So uh, we decided to stay. That was probably the most, you know, in, a chi in childhood, have your dad gone for a whole year. I probably saw him three times in that year. You know, okay. he flew back and uh, yeah. stuff like that. I can still remember that year because that was the 88 Olympics because my uh, mom went to yeah. Columbia for her visit to Columbia. And I stayed with some neighbors during the 88 Olympics, which was a pretty good highlight because they had tickets to everything, which was awesome. Oh, so I got to do a lot of uh, sporting stuff. Yeah. Because Petra Canada was the main, uh, yeah, they were the sponsors for the whole thing, eh? So. Yeah. It was oh, great. Yeah. Bob yeah, sled went... and you know, all sorts of stuff. It was exciting. No, yeah, for sure. I'm just checking my uh, phone here because I want to, I'm taught in time in this. Just... No worries. Just to make sure we do that. No, that's really cool. I was actually in the Olympics. I, I went to, I saw bobsled and I saw Russia and the, no, sorry, the Soviet Union yes. play, play the Swedes. That's what I saw. Okay. So yeah, my brother, went... my, and my brother is cheering for the Soviets. That's <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah, well, it, everybody. Yeah, why Yeah, and then I, know, I ended up. Okay. When my dad, so my dad did a year in Columbia and then when, uh, when that wrapped up, there was no job back in Calgary and that's mm -hmm. when we moved to Saskatchewan. So my dad got a job with the provincial government uh, and he worked in okay. a SAS pension plan is where he, uh, he went into. Uh, and again, we were still in Calgary. I remember he moved to Regina and it was winter. It was like November or something like that. <laughs> and we moved over in like January or February. Okay. Uh, and it was like, it wasn't a shock because Calgary is cold, but it's not the same type of cold as in no. Saskatchewan. It's not that no. like five weeks of minus 20 to minus 40 and yeah. no let up. In Calgary, you get the Chinook or you get the sort of like a rolling thing. It's cold and then it warms up. And it doesn't get much below 20 in Calgary usually. It can, but it, not very often, and it's certainly not yeah. for long durations. You go to Edmonton, you go over to even Medicine Hat. It's a different thing. Like Edmonton is the same as Winnipeg, essentially. It's exactly the same climate. Calgary is actually closer to the uh, Pacific Ocean, and it gets a little yeah. bit of that warmer, moist air. That's why you get in, in the wintertime, right? So that's why it gets a lot of snow, and it's, yeah. uh, not, it's a little bit more temperate. And like, you know, my parents live in Lethbridge, so it's a little more, it's even warmer there, right, for the yeah. same, same reasons, but. Did they, yeah. did they retire there? Did they decide to retire down in Lethbridge? Well, or? no, they've been there for 20 years and they, because they're farmers and, but they're not big farmers. Like we're, we had a kind of small farm and it was getting to the, be the point where um, people were, um, to continue on, you had to have a lot of land or a lot of capital. Yeah. And you just, you, they, you have to go big or go home essentially, right? So. So they decided dad get a, he got a job in Lethbridge and then kind of quit that after a while, but he, uh, he just, they like it there. It's warmer. doesn't get a lot of snow. So you don't have to shovel the snow as much. And, yeah. and, uh, it's Lethbridge is a nice city. Like it's a nice oh, size. It. It's, um, not much to do there, but it's really good for older people. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you're really has, has everything, yeah. Has everything you need right. without, without any more. So that's, that's kind of what it is. Yeah, so. but I like it as a little little spot. You know, you're a couple of hours from Calgary and yeah. a couple of hours for some premium skiing at uh, Whitefish or something like that. So it's a good spot. Yeah. So, anyways, yeah, they moved. That's they moved there for that reason. They kept kept farming for a little while, then now he rents out the land to one of our neighbors. Oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah, uh, cool. he's going to sell it, I think, here soon. So if you're looking for some property in loose land. <laughs> probably not at the at the moment <laughs> um yeah he might sell if he gets a good price anyways yeah so so then moved to, to uh regina basically for your high school years more or less yeah i think eh? it was like 12 or 13 when we got to uh 12 okay. i think we got to regina and so yeah finished i think yeah it's great it was the second half of grade six grade seven and grade eight and then high school um, and you know, I actually, Regina is a great, you know, I know it, it, it's the butt of many, uh, a joke, uh, but it was a great place. It was a great place to grow up, uh, yeah. in that, that, that time. Um, you know, I had a, a really excellent 
mix of, of friends, you know, cross-culturally as well, uh, which was probably a bit more rare. And certainly comparing to Calgary at the time, it was certainly a lot more homogeneous. Um, but it was just a really great place to, to grow up. I was just desperate. And the reason I went to Saskatoon was to get out under the thumb of my from the thumb of my parents. I just didn't, <laughs> I couldn't imagine living at home and then going to the U of R and having my parents judge, you know, how much I was studying and things like that. So I was like, yeah, Saskatoon's a great city. I love going up there. It's a beautiful spot. I had friends up there, people that I knew from, uh, yeah. you know, just from other stuff that I had done, sports and things like that. I thought, perfect. It's a beautiful campus, great spot. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to live in res and that's where we met and you know many of us uh connected through that that one single choice yeah that's amazing like i, I went there on a whim like i just for the hell of it i just uh i didn't know where i was gonna stay because i was working in bc that summer then i got back it's like man i gotta find a place to stay in saskatoon because i didn't know where i was gonna stay so i phoned up res hey can i can i stay there and they let you in because i have mentioned this on a podcast before but if you uh, go there by yourself it's a lot easier to get a room in res right uh, single people yeah. is easier than a than double people because they'll just pair you up with whoever yeah and that's what they well, did pair me up with the guy that i didn't know and he's a nice guy but he left after uh christmas because i don't think it was really his thing he, he was a hardcore yeah. christian hey okay um pretty straight lace funny guy like he was a good guy but no yeah it was not his place <laughs> at all and he had a girlfriend so he's always at her house Hosty yeah, moved okay. in because Hosty was living with his sister, but he's oh, basically right. sleep, he was sleeping over every night, <laughs> every weekend. <laughs> so he finally said, "Well, do you want to move in?" He's like, "Yeah, I'll move in." So we came and we became roommates that first year, uh, second half of the first year, which uh, you know the knob was already at ten at that point. We turned it up to twelve, yeah, or beyond. I'm so actually, uh, okay. Well, I want to hear, well, first of all, what high school did you go to then? Campbell Collegiate. Oh, yeah, right, right, Campbell. Yeah, so the over the overachieving school in Regina, I don't know what it's like anymore, but at the time it was like, you know, they had the IB program there, they had the top musical programs, you know, yeah. it was the, I mean, maybe I'm biased because I went there, but like it had great facilities, amazing teachers, it, it felt like it was the premium school, and when I, where I grew up in the um, in the, I guess, be the eastern part of the city, uh, there wasn't really a lot of options uh, about where you could go. I think there's high schools out there now. Um, you could go to Balfour, which was more of like a sporting sort of school, uh, or Campbell, or into the Christian system, and because uh, um, the Catholic system, separate school, whatever it was, or you could go. I think we had one yeah. Luther. I think was one private school. I, you know, my parents were like. Campbell's the one. Oh, and my brother went to Campbell Collegiate as well because that's where the specialist program was for autistic oh. kids in Regina. And they were integrated, even back then, they were integrated into regular, you know, like where possible into regular uh, instruction and programs. So, yeah. um, you know, I used to run into my brother four or five times a week at school, which was cool because mm -hmm. that wasn't the way it was, I guess, when we lived in Calgary. So it's a separate school. Cool. Yeah, right on. And so then you went to U of S and uh, yeah. for res. You were uh, roommates with Ryan Loft? Yeah, not in my first year. So I had a similar experience oh. to you in my first year. I lived with a guy from Prince Albert called Bill Klein was his name. Um, Did I even know that? Maybe, I don't know. Um, he was a lot <laughs> like your roommate, uh, in, but in different ways. So uh, Bill uh, no was har hardly ever there. He had a girlfriend as well that was okay. outside. And like sometimes like he would just be gone for like three weeks. Like okay. you, you would never, you wouldn't see him. Um, the other thing, which I can't believe it was like allowed at the time was Bill smoked, like smoked cigarettes. And he would literally yeah. lie in our room at night and like smoke cigarettes. So I hardly spent, well, when he was there, I was never in my own room. And yeah. if you remember a lot of the guys, we figured out ways that we could turn like the two beds side by side. You could stack them and make them like yeah. bunk beds. They're like yeah. a step yeah. brother style, but a lot, a lot safer. Right? Not much uh, safer, actually. No, not much. Not much safer. <laughs> yeah, no. But well, I don't, I don't recall anyone getting no. flat, like crushed no. underneath. It certainly wasn't safe, but it was safer. Um, so made more room always, in the room too, right? That was the best yeah, part. That's of right. It. You had, you could have like a lounge area on one side with yeah. a couch and you could stack things up. Um, so I ended up because of the fact that he smoked and like. 
you know, I grew up in a completely anti-smoking household in my, you know, like just growing up, my grandma and grandpa on my mom's side both died of lung cancer. Like, holy it was shit. A, yeah. You know, it was, so I was super anti-smoking, like just get me away. So if he was ever there, I was in somebody else's room. So it was always across the hallway with Scott Hernier and Jason Golding, because they were right across the hall. Okay. Uh, and then it was uh, Mike Fraser and Jeff Gerhardt. Right. You know? And so there was like the five of us, you know, and we, we were, we all sort of had these shared rooms. I mean, even at one point to give you how crazy things were at one point, Mike Fraser, Jeff Gerhardt, Scott Herndier, and Jason Golding put two sets of bunk beds. So we had one room that was set aside just for like lounging and drinking. Right. 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 And then this is a nap time room. That's right. It was just, there was a room for partying and hanging out and socializing. And then there was yeah. room for sleeping or studying. And I guess res provided that because there were study spaces and there was the library and there was, you know, you didn't need to go outside for anything. Uh, you know, even during winter, people used to give me shit for wearing my shorts and a t-shirt and, and like sandals or, you know, yeah. like soft feet to class Beautiful. on a minus three day. You know, Loved like, it. You know, now on campus, did you know that? They've completed the ring. Oh, have they? Underneath okay. the ground. So the tunnel goes all the way around and over to engineering. Basically, you can go to engineering now. I think education is the only one you can't get to uh, indoors. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty slick down there. And he, the administration building now, it's reopened the college building and it goes underneath yeah. that way. So, but there, uh, were you there? A few of us did a tour underneath the tunnels. I did a tour yes, with, with, with Dennis. Yeah, I was there. I was there on that one. <laughs> I thought you were. Yeah, I'm ready. And it took us through the tunnels, the, the, yeah. uh, the steam ducts and everything. Because there's, there's a steam plant on campus that, you know, distributes all the uh, heat for all the buildings yeah. there. So there's tunnels everywhere. And we, we did a tour. We hit all the buildings. It was incredible. Like, what a tour. And he's like, you can't tell anybody. I'll get fired. And I'm like, well. Yeah. Well, thank okay. God. He's, long, he's probably long gone now. The <laughs> highlight for me for that tour was, you know, being a bit of a nerd was, remember we went into the uh, spot where, like, now would be, like, the main hub for the internet connection. It was like, because the net was still pretty new then. Right. Of, yeah. Uh, yeah. We went down and you could, there was, like, the hub where all the fiber off stuff went in you know and that was ahead of its time for then having fiber optic connections on campus and it was like yeah this is if you knock this out here you'd kill the internet yeah. basically in saskatoon because that's where it was all centralized was around that thing and yeah we got to go in and have a look yeah that's that's pretty cool yeah it was it was quite the experience man so uh <laughs> you know the right people you can see a lot of really cool stuff and it was like middle of the night we were doing this kind of stuff we were not supposed to be doing that at all so no not that's, at all it's pretty sweet <laughs> But yeah, no, yes. And uh, yeah, there's a tunnel basically at the time though from the residence to like say where the cafeteria place is, to the library, to the Place Real Student Center. Yeah. Um, in that for area. And, the, the and then over to the arts, arts and science and the commerce building. That was all underground. You could be indoors all day without ever having to go out for for anything. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty exceptional. So <laughs> you should have done that. And I don't blame you. That was awesome. Yeah. And uh, people hated res students for that. And I was like, good. But I never had to do, I couldn't do that very often. because I always had to go over to uh, campus. Yeah, and engineering was the one that was, you know, the furthest away and the, the most isolated. Yeah, but I made up for it by like never going before noon. So that worked out right. pretty well for me. <laughs> well, you know what, you know, what the, and this, I keep coming back to this because there's a real battle here in Australia uh, at the moment over like, what you do like what you do when you finish school do you do university or do you do a trade you know like because okay yeah uh, and you know one of the things i guess we program kids to do at school is like you got you have to do it this way right you know it's like go in the morning and sit there until i tell you, you can stand up and then go and do this and yeah. i am not good at that <laughs> i mean that's why I, ha I work for myself because I'm yeah. not good at following instructions or, uh, well, I can, I can follow instructions, but I like to, you know, figure out my own way. Can I improve this or do it better? And uh, university, thankfully, taught me that, you know, like I, I don't have to go. If I can read the book and have interaction with the professor or whatever and get the questions answered in a format that's not going to class, I have that option. Yeah. Uh, what, so, what, did, what did you take in school? I was all over the place. Yeah, I really didn't I thought know what so. to do. Yeah. Like, I came in initially, uh, my grandfather was a dentist and I loved the idea of 
um, uh, of like setting your hours. Like if you wanted to work, you know, 5 a.m. till noon on a Monday to service people who wanted to come in early and then stay late another yeah. night. Uh, and it was a professional thing. And I know my mom, my mom always told me we had a lovely lifestyle as kids and as young adults because, you know, my, my father was a, you know, a dentist. So that was sort of where I wanted. So I started uh, in chemistry uh, and I found, I guess, the sort of, um, it was very, you know, there was, if there was a limited place that you could go with that. It was like, what, what are my options if I don't get into the, to dentistry? Because I then started to compare myself with many of my classmates and what they were striving to do and achieve, get into med or, you know, get into physiotherapy or, you know, like some other professional college. And like, I was not as motivated or sure uh, mm -hmm. what I wanted to do. So I basically uh, started to take uh, human physiology classes uh, and then eventually started to take commerce stuff. I did, I mean, I did all those sorts of things. I did, um, you know, I think it was Ape Culture 314, which nice. was, uh, Honey steps, it was statistics for, but it was part of agriculture. Beekeeping. Uh, it was part of the beekeeping part, nice. but it was, it qualified <laughs> as a statistical uh, qualification. So you didn't need to do okay. mathematics statistics, which went way beyond what I was going to need to use for whatever I was doing. Yeah. Gave me a basic background, but it also exposed me to a lot of the people in the agricultural uh, college. So I really tried to spread myself out because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I didn't actually figure out what I wanted to do until, yeah. you know, several years after leaving school. So I didn't really uh, figure it out there. And yeah, I guess. Did you, did you graduate from university? No. But how long were you there for? All, all told. Uh, so I did four. I did four sort of part time, you know, maybe three quarter time years, and then another year okay. uh, before I left. And again, I I always intended to finish. It's just not the way things worked out. Uh, yeah. And I think that you know, forgetting that it's important to finish. And like, if anyone's listening that says, Oh, you know, you can, if, if you do it, you should, you should see it through. I, I think you should. Um, oh, yeah. In hindsight, I should have just, I mean, it's not like I was far away or anything like that. And then you find out when you want to go back that after 10 years or whatever, that all the stuff you did, you can't use anymore. Cause I had planned, uh, you know, on finishing a couple of classes yeah. here and just, you know, right. getting the, the certificate. Um, but also the things that you learn along the way, uh, how to deal with other people, how to uh, deal with difficult or challenging situations, uh, all that sort of stuff, that that's just as important as the piece of paper as well. I mean, well, I think uh, my opinions have really changed in university quite a bit because I did engineering, which is almost like, it's a, it's a professional college and, you know, I'm happy I did it, but I'm not doing any engineering. I've never done any yeah. engineering. And the uh, way I look at it, it's like, it, but if you want a job somewhere, that's how they weed you out. So if you don't have a degree, you suffer to get jobs in lots of places. It's a credentialization service in, in, in a lot of ways, right? So I tell like I can tell my kids, get a degree. I don't really care what it's in. Just yeah. get a degree. Then you have a degree. And then you at least yeah. start there. And then they'll get you a job. And if you are interested in something, study that. And, you know, maybe who knows where it's going to lead you. But yeah. take four years, get it, get it done. And then you have it. And you can't, like me, I have my... I have an engineering degree. I'm not doing any engineering. No matter what happens, I still have that degree and it always puts my name on that, you know, on that, if I do a resume or whatever it is, it's always yeah. going to be there. I'm not yeah, using it right. I ever studied, you know? What's that? What sort of engineer, engineering did you do? I was the last graduate, me and two others of the geophysical engineering program at the oh, University right. of Saskatchewan. So. That's right. I like, and I liked it because it was a very comprehensive program. It covered everything. It did civil engineering. Uh, chem chemistry we did materials we did geology we did uh, engineering physics type stuff yeah lots of math we did as much math as anybody in, on campus and i hated it all and but i liked it because it was all is very comprehensive so it touched everything especially of all the yeah. engineering disciplines and i was thinking well cool if i could do that I can, that means i can kind of do anything but they get out of school all i can be is a seismologist <laughs> so. yes <laughs> like, well, well, this, I know that. And, and this is this is but, where right. I think the problem lies is that you know you do specialize and then yeah. you realize that the thing that you have specialized in maybe from a workforce thing is not exactly what you want to do. And you know uh, what? And, I my career. Oh, I'm, I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. 
what I benefit from my career is that I'm not a specialist by heart. I'm a generalist. I can do anything. Okay. (laughs) So I can take a task and do it and I can figure it out. Yeah. And I just, you know, if it interests me, I'll do it. I'm a generalist. I'm not a specialist. And you're right. The society is designed to be looking for people's education system is trying to find specialists. What do you do? Who are you? You know, like, yeah. And like, I, don't know. I mean, my, my career now is so, so varied. Uh, you know, I span everything from like sort of the entrepreneurial space, uh, you know, marketing, tourism, heritage, you know, like yeah. I didn't study history or anything at school. Um, yeah. I, but you know, I, I would argue now that I spend more time reading and knowing, knowing about historical stuff than, you know, people who might have specialized in. 19 you know 17th century ukrainian history or something like that you know yeah. i have a practical history uh sort of experience from what i do uh here in perth now so yeah you know, I, I think my education laid the foundations for what i do now right. but it's not the main reason that i do what i do and yeah. i don't again i think you can layer like i went back um because because my main businesses are in tourism i went back to our what we call tafe here technical and further education so this sort of trade school type thing and i did you know a, some practical courses so i was qualified for things to do i have a certificate for in tour guiding you know it's the oh. it, a nationally recognized <laughs> course that you do in australia to become a tour guide and cool. that's one of the jobs that i do so i'm recognized from that in Australia with a certificate. I don't have okay. no, I don't have it up on the wall or anything like that, but I've got it. <laughs> Same thing with I have a diploma of tourism, an advanced, okay. sorry, an advanced diploma of tourism as well. Right. And most of that stuff I actually got through what they call recognition of prior learning because I I had been doing it for years and you basically they go yeah. through a list and you like check off, tell me how you would do this and how you do that. And then in the end right. they essentially go, give us a fee and here's your paper. So it still commoditizes the the actual yeah giving out of the of the the certificate or the accreditation it's a but, recognition of your experience and your yeah. abilities i guess yeah yeah that's really cool hey kate so i want to talk about that because that's you're one of the top people on my list i have a list okay people i want to talk to i'm glad i'm on the top of that list no i'm not the top but you're on the okay, list not- like i told brad peterson he's not even on the list but i do this okay person. but you um so you finished school because yeah. I want to talk, we should talk again sometime anyways, but yeah, yeah, let's um, have a little we'll separate but, catch up. But you travel a bit, and I remember the, how much you traveled quite a bit, and you had some yeah. pretty good stories and stuff like that. So you decided, I'm done, and you start traveling and take some time off. And where'd you go? Yeah, well, UK, you said, let's go back to the, the realization point because essentially what happened was I was at school. But I was also working at the same time. I worked at the the Sutherland Bar, which was our oh, yeah. res uh, our res sponsored bar and uh, and the yeah. engineering bar and the commerce bar and stuff. At that time, it was it was a pretty full on uh, sort of place. And so I, I worked like four or five nights a week. Plus, I was going to school, and I was like, "Why am I doing this? I don't know what I want to do. I need to do something that." scrambles things up a bit so I can figure out what I'm going to do. Because if I'm not careful, I might still be, and I'm nothing wrong, I don't want to be disparaging on anyone who works in hospitality or things like that, but I just didn't see myself long-term what working in hospitality. So I didn't see myself yeah. long-term at university, didn't see myself long-term in hospitality, so what am I going to do? I, we, a couple of us put together a plan. It was me, Jeff Gerhardt, and Ryan Loff. We put together their plan and said, let's buy an around-the-world ticket and let's just go traveling. Mm-hmm. So I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. So I decided I wasn't going to go back to school the next year. So I didn't re-enroll. I got a summer job at, uh, in crop science. So, you know, all the, all the fields uh, by yeah. the high rise towers there, I yeah. did hand harvesting of like oats and wheat and then like seed processing and stuff like that. I did that oh, five yeah. days a week. Cool. Uh, and then I did uh, six or se- sometimes seven nights a week at the Sutherland Hotel. I ran, I, I worked on the door and I ran the beach volleyball league. That was mm. thing. So, and I lived in a place that cost me Man, the good old days. I think it cost me like a hundred and thirty dollars a month to live in this thing. So I was in a, a share house, um, not far. From, I could walk to the university uh, for work, and I could—not that I ever did, but I could have. Yeah. Um, and so, totally low living expense. And the whole idea was hoard up as much cash as I could. And yeah. the plan was to go away for a year. 
And yeah. then in that year, I would discover, you know, different cultures and, and maybe something that cliche I would find, find myself. Mm -hmm. In the end, uh, it only ended up being Jeff Gerhardt and I who went away. And so we left Saskatoon on Halloween 2001. And our plan took us uh, basically around the world going west. Uh, and, you know, we just headed off and with no real plan about what to do in each of the spots that we were going to go to. Because, again, the internet was still, like, it wasn't new, but there wasn't as much stuff about travel and things as there are now. There weren't yeah. as many services that you could access. And we just went away. So we started off in Tahiti and then we went to the Cook Islands, and then we went to Fiji, which Jeff and I both fell in love with the, the culture in Fiji. Um, really different uh, attitude towards life, something that I wasn't used to. So Fiji time, they just, it's going to get done, but you just got to accept that it's going to get done when they feel like doing it. Yeah. And like, it's so different to our culture of like, I need this done now. Like, you're causing me grief by not doing it. If everyone's sort of in a similar mentality, the opposite way, stuff does still yeah. get done. Yeah. There's more time to enjoy life and to be, you know, sort of, I guess it's not as regimented, which yeah. uh, I think I discovered was a big part of what I needed in what I did in the future was for it to be less structured or for me to be able to structure in a way that I needed it to be. So it worked for the way my life, uh, the, the way my brain works. So the way I like to do things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we went to New Zealand and Australia uh, and Australia was our big sort of massive trip. We bought a van uh, and we traveled right. about two thirds of the country. We did the entire East coast, <clears throat> went down through the middle and background. We met some amazing people, lifelong friends, people who I'm still friends with uh, mm. today uh, from that journey. Uh, and, you know, I loved it here. I never imagined at that time that I would ever have the opportunity to live here. That was never uh, a thought at that time. It was like, right. wow, I'm just glad I've seen so much of it. Mm -hmm. uh, headed into Southeast Asia. And that was probably where I discovered that maybe I was born in the wrong, wrong place. <laughs> um, you know, like you sort of win, you get what you're given, right? You know, I was yeah. born in Ottawa and, you know, that's the way that it was. But yeah. Asian culture and food and again, more of the sort of chaos side of things uh in southeast asia uh was something that i actually really enjoyed it was completely different to fiji but um you know the whole idea of like walking down the street and going i'm hungry right now there's a dude grilling a leg of chicken you know like a chicken drumstick on the thing i'm gonna i'm just gonna have that right there you know we don't it's fast food but different to the way that yeah. that we think yeah. about it uh you know yeah. in the americas or in europe or wherever else so i really enjoyed that and then was off to uh, England. And the plan was mm. that uh, because of the, the Commonwealth connection that you could get the two year uh, working visa mm -hmm. in England. Mm -hmm. So you could do whatever you wanted for two years and you could stay for then. And I thought, well, okay. I'm not ready to go home yet. I still haven't figured out what it is I want to do. Yeah. Uh, London is the, you know, in my mind is the center. You know, pe some people say it's New York. Other people say it's London. To me, London's the center of the western culture universe it's mm -hmm. it's just you know the, the well british ties in america and, with europe in a big way right so and and just yeah. the, the whole british empire and it's you know it's connections to you know to the indian subcontinent and to, to yeah. the south pacific and it's just, it's just africa such a, yeah yeah it's just such a, a connection point for people all over the world and and things that i love uh you know like music and art and history and museums and science and like so where'd you stay there how, how can you afford to live in london for two years or how well, long you're there? Number, one, number one it took traveling around the world takes careful budgeting sure. uh and particularly when you're looking at like an extended period of time it's it's not easy yeah. um, i had a couple of hiccups along the way uh i left i had a at the time i had like the most advanced like video and digital camera you could buy in the early 2000s it was sony it was like oh, oh this big it, wow. it took two megapixel photos and had like a mini <laughs> uh mini dv camera in it and it was just awesome cool. uh, by accident it got left in australia and yeah. uh, thankfully one of my friends sent it like via dhl to me in bangkok Holy but then cow. i got my first experience of having to deal with uh, bribery uh, to get what you want in southeast <laughs> asia so basically because camera was made in Japan they yeah. were going to try and charge me duty 
yeah. on it. Even though with my camera, it was, wasn't brand new. They were going to charge, charge me duty, which at the time they calculated out, it was going to be about a thousand dollars Canadian, which was roughly half of the overall cost of the thing that I bought at the yeah. time before I left. Right. So I had to find for, so first I had to find someone who could help me bribe somebody. So I had to find somebody who spoke English and Thai and who knew the system. And in the end, it ended up costing me a couple hundred bucks to get out uh, and a day's worth of work. Thank if Jeff Gerhardt ever sees this, thanks for supporting me through a very stressful situation. Um, <laughs> Holy cow. I, Anyways, yeah, so, so that took off like a thousand dollars was a lot. And that was the money that I had to get myself set up in London. Yeah. So in the end, I uh, begrudgingly went back and begged my parents, like, can you each give me $500? Otherwise, when I get to London, like, I don't know where I'm going to, to like how I'm going to get set up. Yeah. When we got to London though, thankfully, uh, there was a guy from South, uh, from Prince Albert uh, uh, and from U of S as well, who I knew from there, a guy called Jeff Scott. Um, he was friends with Jeff Gerhardt and they had worked together at uh, Fox and Hounds. And so mm -hmm. there was this sort of little connection. He picked us up at Heathrow and we stayed at his place uh, for a couple of weeks uh, for okay. free. We just crashed on the couch. And like London, you're right, is ridiculous. You go anywhere yeah. and it costs you the equivalent of, you know, $20, 20 Canadian yeah. just to, to like travel or whatever. So it's, yeah. it's ridiculous. Yeah. But with the working visa, obviously the motivation was to get a job immediately. And like, I guess uh, what I didn't realize when I got to England was that the type of like work attitude that I had developed from, you know, working hard at the bar and saving all that money to be able to go away made me a highly desirable employee uh, mm -hmm. in England because it's quite a relaxed working culture. It's like, I'm going to smoke. It's my right to smoke. Uh, I'm going to take 10 fag breaks a day. You know, right. That adds up to quite a lot of time. I don't smoke. So suddenly I'm 50% more productive than everyone who smokes cigarettes and right. I was reliable right. and you know, like all of these things. So I started yeah. off my first job there in a uh, call center, just doing data entry. I wasn't even answering the phones and I just, I loved it because it was mind numbing. Uh, and it was also uh, in the late afternoon to later evening. So during the day I could experience London during the day. Oh yeah. I could do course. a lot of stuff that was, that was yeah. free uh, just wandering around. So it fit yeah. in perfect uh, with my lifestyle. And then after that first couple of weeks that gave us actually, I think Jeff uh, fronted the cash for us to, for the bond for our first room together. So we moved into a share house in North London uh, in a place called, called Harlesden with um, uh, just some random guys uh, okay. and uh, just ourselves uh, set up there. And I think I ended up staying in that house with Jeff for about maybe it was two or three months. Jeff, I don't think was as keen to stay. He wanted to travel Europe right away. And I'd sort of, we'd been mm. traveling for almost a year and I was like, oh, just, I'm just keen to do a little bit of, of work, get some cash in the bank and, yeah. and maybe do some, some more traveling. So uh, Darren Mitchell came over at that point and we did some small like sort of trips here and there. Like I think uh, we went to, for obvious reasons, we went to Amsterdam uh, a couple of times, you know, uh, you know, smoking a joint and then yeah. walking around the red light district is one of the most crazy things, you know, that considering, you know, it's not like that really anywhere else. It was just an eye opener that that was a possibility yeah. of something that you could do. And, you know, you can imagine the three of us, you know, all, all three of us, what it was like, the laughs that were had, the jokes that were told, <laughs> you know, just, it was, it was probably one of the most, uh, you know, the funnest things that I've ever done. Uh, and then Jeff decided to go home. So Darren okay. came for a holiday. It was like a summer holiday. I think he had just graduated from education. And so it was before he was going to come back and try and focus on getting a teaching job. Uh, and when he went back, Jeff was like, I think, I think I'm ready to go home. So I then decided, I said, well, I'm not, I've decided I'm going to stay on my own. Yeah. And then I think it was around that same time that Ryan Loft decided to come over. So that worked out well um, that, you know, I was decided to stay, but then I had another friend who was coming over. Um, I then moved into this, the share house that Jeff Scott initially let me stay in for two weeks. He was, he had headed home, I think, or maybe he had gone off traveling. I think he'd come maybe here to Australia. I can't really remember where he went. He comes back into my story a number of years later in here in okay. Australia. Um, <laughs> 
but I moved into this house and that's where um, I formed some, again, more lifelong friendships. And one today that now extends to uh, my best friend and my business partner in a lot of the ventures that I've got going on. Well, that's so interesting. Into, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I moved into this house and one of the guys that I bonded with, uh, crazy, I seem to attract Ryan's as friends. I don't know whether we've got <laughs> you know something, uh, but this guy's name was Ryan uh, as well. Now he was about to leave uh, and to go to Canada. He was going to spend a year uh, working at, he worked at the Post Hotel as a concierge at, at Lake Louise, or mm -hmm. sorry, yeah, at Lake Louise and, mm -hmm. you know, a year of snowboarding. Yeah. And so in the final weeks, I took over his room. He stayed in the house before we went and we formed this like incredible bond. We, we went out regularly. We were just, you know, you yeah. give any sort of analogy, two peas in a pod or whatever you want to say. We just, yeah. we enjoyed each other's company. Yeah. We had a laugh together. We had a super amount of fun. So we cemented a friendship there. Then he goes off um, and goes to Canada. At that point, uh, I'm living the, the London lifestyle. Um, I get a, an incredible job. Uh, I start to work for, um, I start off through a temp agency. Uh, they got me a job just doing some uh, basic, you know, basic office work at Transport for London. This is the the government uh, entity under, you know, like the Mayor of London, and the City of London, that okay. runs all of the um, uh, all of the transport things, the London Underground, all of the okay. street life, the Docklands Light Railway. Uh, they manage all of the stations. It's a huge organization. Wow. Huge. Uh, and it's first time ever working for government at this point, and so I've never had any experience in that. And I got this uh, temp job, and within two weeks, they were like, we're building a team to do this, to do a number of uh, different projects uh, from a strategy perspective. We need different opinions, different life experiences. We like your attitude. Would you like to join this team? And I was like, for sure. So my boss, <laughs> uh, she was from Pakistan. Uh, there had a lady from Gabon uh, who was in my team, in our team. We had an American guy. Uh, we had one English guy and we had somebody else from somewhere else. Like it was this multicultural team. And we took on um, two projects, which were just like, they were just eye opening, you know, in terms of what you could do as a job. So the first one that we looked at was a efficiency uh, sort of project. So in transport for London, there was like, there was the procurement function. So buying everything from like the pen that you use all the way to buying, like procuring stuff for the London underground for extension of tracks and things like that. Sure, yeah. There were 225 people who worked in procurement across the entire business. Oh, wow. Yeah. So huge amount of, you know, blow Loaded, typical and you know like bureaucratic uh, yeah. sort of things where you know everyone's jobs protected despite the fact it could be done in a better way even though that's um, a department that's designed to make things more efficient right so you don't spend too yeah. much money and they have they're bloated so they yeah. would never allow say their people are buying from to have the same sort of bloat that they may themselves exactly. <laughs> be exhibiting exactly so <laughs> <laughs> um, my job in that was to basically um, create, it. like, so the first thing I had to do is everyone, like, you got to do different things on every project, which was really cool. So my first thing was, mm. you need to make a presentation, okay, to the the management team, okay, and they, they had all kinds of consultants, and they had McKinsey and Deloitte, they had every, you know, and then they had all them helping this on as well. But we were an internal team that focused on, you know, looking at it from the inside. Um, they um, They said, okay, your job for this one is to... Uh, is to create something that's going to be dramatic at the presentation that we're going to do, right? So yeah. what I did was, this is, we didn't have large format printers back then. And like, I, I didn't know how to use Photoshop or anything like that. Yeah. So essentially for a couple of weeks, what I did was created like an, uh, an org chart that I rolled up into a, into a scroll. And when it okay. came time to describe how bloated the procurement function was, I rolled it out across the boardroom table yeah. Roll across the boardroom table and then fell off the end and rolled out onto the floor. And it was like, that was the signal that like, there's a problem here. And from that point, okay, it was then time to then, you know, um, move on and go, okay, now how are we going to change, how are we going to change this? And so the next thing that we went into was the business was implementing SAP. Have you ever worked at a business yeah. that uses yeah. used SAP before? Our company does. Now, this yeah. Okay. This was the first time I'd had any experience with it. I'd heard about it. Yeah. Uh, 
And, you know, for the type of money that costs to implement it, you obviously want to get it right. So our yeah. team started to focus on um, uh, user forums that were all about, because uh, the organization was so broad, how do you, and again, we were still in procurement on this, how do we integrate SAP and some of the layers they were putting over top of it to restrict? Like, if this pen costs $2 to buy from procurement and you can order this one, and this one costs 30 cents or pence or whatever to order it, do we want to limit you know, like what people can buy at the station or at the, like at, a, at an London underground station or in a corporate environment. So they were putting these layers of SAP around procurement that created catalogs for certain things and uh, all of that. So what we did was we ran all these forums. So we would go out to a station where you'd have a station manager who didn't necessarily even have a, you know, like a completed uh, like school education yeah. and trying to show them how this was going to work. And it gave me a lot of in insight into how to, how to deal with people, how to extract um, things like uh, pressure points and uh, yeah. you know, things that are causing them problems and then working out how to smooth those out. So that was, I mean, it was super exciting and a really cool job. And then we moved on to other things, <laughs> uh, congestion yeah. charging. So uh, I, not that I did anything directly with that, but our strategy team was all about plugging some gap internally uh, so introducing the first round of congestion charging and I was fortunate enough to do uh, some of the uh, be involved again in some strategy stuff around pre-transport planning for the London Olympics. So it was just a really like in one job, I got experience across well, 100 areas. Because you're an entrepreneur by heart and you're being an entrepreneur in that business though. That's what I like about it. Right. And you're looking for those efficiencies and you're treating it like it's your own, it seems. In a way. Well, you're yeah. always like that. You're very conscientious. You know what I mean? Even if, when you're being a fool, you, you were always like, but you, you know what I mean? Like instead like going yeah. to school and partying, but you, you were a bartender. So you can party yeah. and kind of control yourself a little bit that way and actually make money instead of just blowing it all, all the time. And uh, yeah, you were always like that anyway. So it's really cool to see these habits that you're picking up and I'm guessing you're applying them elsewhere. We've been talking for over well over an hour, and I love it. Um, okay. I want to push on, though, because how long did you work with them, that group then, the uh, transport? London God, it, was, it was over a year. So it got to a point where yeah. they, were trying to, they were trying to lock down a team because we were, we were getting, like, everything mm. that we did, we were getting wins. Like, everyone right. loved each of the things that we were doing. Uh, and so they made an offer to me uh, to uh, move to a, like a more, perf I was on, the visa I was on had the two year time limit. Mm -hmm. uh, and they made an offer to me to uh, go through like a process that would see me be able to obtain British citizenship. Right. Uh, and at that point I was with my partner and yeah. her story sort of intersects with mine and her situation changed my situation. Okay. So she was Australian had but had just because of her parents um she had an italian passport and because of the eu she could work forever in well maybe not forever now that there's no more yeah. england's not in the eu anymore but yeah. who could have conceived that back then i mean we would have had no idea so she actually came from australia and flew over and she worked for a big multinational she worked for unilever mm -hmm. uh, she had an amazing job uh flew all over the globe uh, with Unilever, um, it was, she had an amazing job. So her experience was completely opposite to mine. She had the equivalent of like, you know, a, a middle manager's wage living in England, mm -hmm. but being there like a backpacker and traveler. So she lived in a share house and she spent all our money going traveling, like for the weekend, going to right. you know Poland or wherever, you know, like to wherever you might go. And then when we got together, we sort of decided we would start doing that together. So right. we would go traveling. I remember we went one year to um, uh, Budapest for Christmas and New okay. Year. Yeah. That's where we decided to go. Uh, but whenever we would talk about travel, and particularly because we were traveling on the weekend, we'd meet other people who were on these big, long, extended travel adventures. And she was like, I'm so jealous of you. Like, you've already done that. And like, I'm, I want to go away traveling. And I said, well, to tell you the truth, like, I don't necessarily want to live in London. Uh, yeah. You know, even the two of us together, we're never going to be able to afford the type of lifestyle we could afford living like in Canada or in Australia yeah. or even in a, in a third country. I mean, unless we do something. Well, unless it's anywhere, but that yeah. is in Hong Kong or Tokyo or 
New York City. <laughs> Sydney, even Sydney's on that list as well. Even Melbourne, where she was from, is a little bit like that. I mean, it's, yeah. it's Or crazy. Vancouver, right? It's yeah. Pretty, yeah, yeah, exactly. So we decided, okay, let's, let's throw it all in. She's going to quit her job. I'm going to decline this offer to stay in England, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to go way outside of the box here. We're going to go and spend a year in South America. That's going to be the thing. Jesus, man. We're both in into really into hike. Like, cause my first round of travel was, it was, there was a lot of partying. There was a lot of drinking. There was a lot of debauchery. There was yeah. a lot of chasing girls. It's and, res you know, on the road. Yeah, right? it was, yeah. that's a perfect description. Absolutely spot on. Yeah. Um, South America was going to be about personal stuff. It was going to be about hiking. It was going to be about nature. It was going to be about culture. It was going to be about, um, you know, helping other people, you know, and, and doing other things. And so that was, that was the plan. So, so did again, you go? Where'd you guys go? Yeah. So we flew into, we fl flew into Buenos Aires uh, okay. and I spent a little bit of time there again, beautiful city, but, but another city. And what we really wanted to do is go remote and hiking. So we spent a couple of weeks in Buenos Aires and then we went right down to the very tip of South America to Ushuaia, which is right at the very tip. We'd originally thought back then going to, uh, to the subarctic was like you could get on a, you know, they set aside a couple of rooms on a commercial ship or something going down there. You can go and check it out. There was a lot of tourism going down. We talked about that, but the cost was just too prohibitive. Yeah. It's a we, big we journey, man. Yeah. Yeah. So we basically just started from there. We started down there and we did from town to town, the iconic hikes of South, Southern Argentina and Southern Chile. So we sort of like zigzag, you know, it's quite narrow down there. So we zigzag back and forth between right. uh, Chile and Argentina all the way up doing some, you know, easy things and some things that push me well beyond uh my comfort zone not cool. just because they were extreme but because the level of safety that we're used to coming from you know and compliance <laughs> we're used to coming from a, a country sure. like Canada. yeah yeah i mean i can still remember going around we were talking about going up into the high bolivian andes and like doing ice climbing and you know stuff that was really really extreme and before the days of you know trip advisor and the internet sitting in the office of the business flipping through the um you know the handwritten uh testimonials that yeah. you would find the thing and clearly these people couldn't speak english because i remember reading one going like do not go with this company like do not yeah. do it like they are so bad in terms of safety and like they you know if something happens i wouldn't be surprised if they just leave you to freeze to death on the mountain or whatever and i was like mm -hmm. okay um so yeah we just spent and in some places where you might have taken like an eight hour bus ride to go from one place to another we would take two weeks to walk yeah yeah sometimes yeah. we'd hire like a, a a man a man and his mule so if it was an extreme hike like there were times where we climbed up and over some mountain passes where the summit of the pass was over 5,000 meters. Like, right. um, I got, uh, That's incredible. Altitude sickness, yeah. Yeah. uh, and I wouldn't wish that upon anyone. Like it was debilitating. It was awful. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also got to see things that, you know, very few, you know, true remote, true remote wilderness things where very few people have been able to touch it or ruin it or exploit it where it was very, very uh, natural in the way it probably yeah. looked 10,000 years ago. It's nice to know that places like that still exist in this world. Yeah. And it's important that we go. The reason now I look back and I'm glad that I went to them is it gives me appreciation when I see something that's been completely degraded. It's like we need, people need to go and see these things to gain an appreciation of what yeah. they are so that we'll hopefully protect them uh, you know, for, for people who haven't seen it. Cause if we turn into a complete concrete jungle, the entire planet, you know, if we become yeah. uh Coruscant or, you know, whatever that yeah. will, uh, that's not going to be good for anyone. Can I appreciate it from my basement here in Saskatchewan? You can. <laughs> I've been admiring the, the painting that you've got behind your head uh, there. It just reminds me of that. That actually reminds me of some of the scenery, you know, that I experienced in, in, in South America. I know that's definitely not, that's probably like, it's my, quite uh, tree lines. So it could be northern Saskatchewan, maybe. It might be northern Al Manitoba, maybe somewhere up there. Okay. My dad's father-in-law took a picture of that, and then my mom's or my dad's brother-in-law took the photo, and then my mom's brother-in-law he 
he's one of these interesting guys that he just did everything. He did everything. Like he was one of those really guys that got to he he learned how to paint. He did his electronics, doing cars, whatever you name it, he's done it. He got into painting. Saw that picture, so he painted the picture. This is in my basement of my house I grew up in. So I was always playing hockey against the wall in the rumpus room. Yeah. In our basement for years and years and years. And a couple, couple of years ago, I said, you know, I want this painting. Yeah. That Uncle Keith, my Uncle Keith made paintings for my whole family. <laughs> like everybody had paintings. So I took it from home and then my house burned down. My parents' house burned down in February. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I'm glad I had, this is like my, one of the few things we still have from our house. I put it in my room. And so it's kind of, I like having it there as my little, comfort painting <laughs> no, I love it it's just one of those things that you, you sort of notice yeah. uh, and you know here looking at art you've never that that type of imagery there's only yeah. you know, like a handful of places here that and they don't look like that but they would even have snow yeah. on the ground or whatever so our our imagery from painting when they go to the gallery yeah. or look at people's homes looks very different to that yeah totally hey yeah this is like northern parkland so maybe yeah south of prince albert maybe and maybe uh, yeah. into Manitoba because my uncle lived in Manitoba, the one that took the photo. So I'm guessing that's where it might okay. have been. I don't know. Anyways. Yeah. So let's keep moving on here. Okay. Love it. Keep moving on. You're like three years of your life so far. Yeah. And it's crazy. Had, is it like you've had, you've had a life si since then? So I have. Yeah. So let, let's, so South America was awesome. Incredible learning experience. One, just one thing that taught me there that we, that's exactly the opposite to the way we grow yeah. up. And again, this is why I think travel and understanding other cultures is so important. Okay. okay. You know, in, in cool. like, if we, to get something done in North America, it's like we raise our, or we raise our voice and we get more aggressive, right? We're like, I deserve this. Give it to me. You know, like yeah. we get more aggressive. It was exactly the opposite in South America. If you're quiet and you, a quiet menacing, that is actually a better way to achieve the result, okay? So we okay. think about how we do things, right? And we think there's only one way to do it because that's the way we've, we've grown up with it. And I learned really quickly that like getting aggro and, and pushing uh, in that scenario, uh, where I was there with the culture and the people I was dealing with, that wasn't gonna get me anywhere. That being silent and standing with not a, even a menacing look, but just being completely calm was actually more unnerving for them and got things got more things achieved than like dialing the volume up or you know doing that traditional american or canadian thing where you get louder and louder and louder so yeah. and this, like each place has a, a lesson everywhere you go every person you meet has a lesson to learn someone to you know something to teach you yeah. Uh, yeah. and it's just about either hopefully noticing that because i think a lot of things now just because we've got so many other distractions fly by our, our yeah. faces and we, we sort of miss it so that's an South interesting America's, insight. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Never South America's that. finished, um, actually contemplated. So here's one thing that could have changed the course of my life that we never did. Calvary Flames were in the Stanley Cup final, and that was 2004, wasn't it? I was there, man. Yeah. So yeah. I'm in, we were setting up our travel to get to like a big enough town so that I could watch the game from South America. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually in the playoffs. It was the lead up to the playoffs. And yep. there was a point, I think we were in, we were in Lima or somewhere like, like that. It was a bigger, bigger town. And it was like the flames won the, in their way into the Stanley cup. Yeah. And I was like, first time I in was, six years. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. was telling, um, uh, my, my partner and she, and my, she was my, my partner and, and travel partner, girlfriend, whatever you say. I actually think yeah. we were, she was my fiance at that point saying, look, when I was a kid, uh, the Flames were in the Stanley Cup final. The one time I had tickets to go, there was it was in May. I think it was May eighty four or eighty six, probably like eighty six, maybe. Yeah. Massive snowstorm in Calgary, ah. and we couldn't get from where we lived in Northwest Calgary to the Saladome to go to the game. So we had tickets, but I couldn't go. That's heartbreaking. So I said, "What? If, what if we go? Okay, we're nearly done here in South America." we haven't decided where we're going to go after this, if we're going to go to Australia or if we're going to go to Canada or if we're going to pick somewhere else. What if we fly to Calgary now for the Stanley cup finals? It's going to be a great atmosphere in Calgary. I don't think we'll be able to get tickets, but you never know. Cause at that time, a lot of our, our like contemporaries were working in oil companies and other things like that who were sponsors of the flames. I thought maybe I might be able to jag a ticket uh, for something. 
It's always tickets Anyways, for sale. The Ray price is always something for yeah, sale. That's, that would have been the biggest uh, biggest problem for us. Anyways, we didn't end up doing that. And I watched the games and, you know, the heartbreaking yeah. uh, loss. Uh, and in the end, the decision was then made that because uh, Leah's family was from Melbourne, lived in Australia, because her family were builders. They had all these houses that they were always like buying and until they got approval to knock them down or improve them or whatever. Oh, sure. They needed people, yeah, they need people to live in them so we could live right. there for free. She said, yeah. let's just go to Australia. And I was like, great, Fair I enough. love Melbourne. Let's go back. So I moved my life over there and we basically started a traditional life that you would think anyone would have as a soon to be married couple uh, in, in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. And that's the way things progressed for almost four years. Okay. Uh, during that period, I set up a life. Um, I had a great, great, great job. I worked for a Japanese consumer electronics company, JVC. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the time they were releasing, you know, amazing technology. The first cameras that allowed you to record to a, a hard, hard drive. Right. Uh, sure. Flash memory, you know, the, the precursor to what we've all got now with one yeah. of these. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I was, uh, it was actually tied me back to my first university job. I worked at Future Shop. Like, so oh, I had experience. I think I knew that. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and so it was great. I had this, I had this lifestyle. Then I had an, it was an aha moment as part of my job. So what I did at JVC was, uh, it was, I was called a product specialist. That was my role. So JVC made hundreds if not thousands of products but because australia is such a small market we only brought a fraction of those products mm -hmm. into australia mm -hmm. uh, and so my job was sort of like threefold number one was to help choose which products uh okay. you know based on research and yep. previous sales would actually work in the market so that was part one cool. part two was to australianize the marketing because if you've ever watched japanese marketing and the messages and the things it's it's not you, you can't sell the way you sell to someone in japan you can't sell that same message in Australia. So we needed to, to make it locally appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. The third thing was to promote, not through sales. So I didn't have any sales targets or anything like that, but to assist the sales team through big product launches. So when we launch a new TV range, like, you know, there'd be a big event. I would plan and then be a presenter at that event. Mm -hmm. And to do smaller stuff, like go and do product training nights for the stores and things like that. And that job took me, I looked after all of Southern Australia and New Zealand. So I looked after- Wow. Uh, Victoria, which is where Melbourne is, uh, New Zealand, Tasmania, South Australia, and Western Australia. Okay? And this is where now yeah. my, my modern life starts to come together uh, with what I do now. Ryan, who yeah. was my flatmate in London, London. or in close yeah. friend in London, who I'd hung out with in Canada, and we did a house uh, boat trip on the shoe swaps on one summer when I came back home. <laughs> like, all again, another, like, you know, this time res on a houseboat. Yeah. Uh, uh, he lived in Perth. Now, I used to come here to okay. Perth for work probably five times a year. Uh, and it's a long way. It's the equivalent. I mean, it's a five-hour flight from Melbourne. So Yeah, it's like from it's here to Montreal, essentially. Yeah, so Yeah, it's a long way. So whenever I would come over, I would stay for, I'd usually fly over uh, Monday, early Monday morning, and then I would work Monday to Friday, and then I wouldn't fly back until Sunday night. Right. And so it gave us an opportunity to catch up and hang out and do like extended stuff. Uh, yeah. Initially, it started off with just like, you know, because I have my corporate credit card, uh, taking them out, like we go out for dinner and I just pay for all the food and booze. Yeah, and sure. You know, it was long work. And then it progressed to things like we'd rent little, uh, like scooters and we would, uh, you know, like drive all through the downtown, you know, and like check out all the sites on scooters. Yeah. Uh, we would do other fun stuff together. Now yeah. in July of 2007, I was here for that exact purpose. That's the, the whole reason I was here was for work. Yeah. And it was, it was Monday, it was Monday night. So it's, you know, just like every other city, it's not like it's, this place doesn't go off on Monday night. It's pretty, uh, and pre particularly during winter as well. July is the middle of winter here. Um, that, um, Ryan came to the hotel and we were, the plan was initially, let's just go out for dinner, have some drinks and, and we'll, we'll hang out. Uh, and that's not the way that it turned out. He said, let's go for a walk around the city. Let's just head off and, and wander around. I'll show you some things here. And so we just sort of, for about two or three hours, we just wandered around the city and just explained a bunch more about why everything was the way it was and filled in historical gaps. And, you know, we went through all these cool places in the city that I'd never seen because my life was hotel, 
to car yeah. to convention center or hotel yeah. to car to consumer electronics. Which you can do in any city, right? Yeah. And it doesn't give you any real insight into what that city's like to live there mm -hmm. or anything like that. You're just a, a passerby. So about an hour into this walk, uh, I'm not kidding you, it felt like that moment that you see when your kids were in a cartoon where you have the idea and the light bulb goes off over your head. It's mm -hmm. like, man, this is what I did when I was traveling. You know, when, I, when we went into Amsterdam, we did the walking tour. When we went yeah. to Berlin, we did the walking tour. When yeah. we were in Buenos Aires, we did the walking tour. Why? It let me know, well, when I was traveling, it was like, where are the good places to drink? Where were they, if I was single, where are the places to meet girls would be? Uh, yeah. If I was hungry, where are the best places to eat? Where if I had questions, I could ask a local and find out of the things I wanted to know about. Yeah, about the, right. The history of the area or whatever else. And I thought, well, is anyone doing that here in Perth? We found out later that nobody was, so let's be the ones to do it. Yeah, you know, and I'll just interject, because like, I went to Boston a few years ago, right, and did the Freedom Trail. Yeah. Which is great. Like, I love it, and I love history. But all you learn is about the history. You're not learning about, like, what goes on there at nighttime, or, you know, who, who lives there now, or that kind of, they don't tell you that stuff. That's the stuff you want to know. <laughs> well, you know, Right? This is that it all intermingles together because like, let's say you're traveling with your, with your wife. Okay. She, you might want to know about who lives there and who does, but she might want to know uh, like where you can get a cocktail or um, you know, where, yeah. you know, some other, some other thing. And the beauty a is great that vegetarian food, meal, you know, or something like that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Great example. Yeah. Um, that where, where, where everyone, can, everyone's in something like this, everyone's interest can be, if you have a good guide, everyone's interest can be catered for answer. It might be structured around a theme like freedom. You know, sure. yeah. You can put in, you know, the freedom to drink, the freedom to be a vegetarian, the freedom to <laughs> nightclub, you know, the freedom to go shopping or the freedom yeah. to, you know, whatever else you can, yeah. you can tie it around that theme. So things progressed super rapidly at this point. Essentially what happened was it wasn't probably a coincidence, but at the same time, my relationship was fairly rocky. We had set a date to be married um, and we had actually come home the previous uh, summer to tell everyone in Canada that the wedding mm. was going to be in Australia because she had a huge family. She was one of sure. 10 kids um, and there was just no way her parents That's were all home. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it was going to be in Australia. So we came home to say, everyone, you've got, it was like a year and a half. You've got to plan the holiday to come over. Yeah. Now things weren't going very well. Um, I knew it. And so I basically said, look, I, I would like to, I would like to end this. And she was like, thank God. Like I actually wanted to, <laughs> but I was too afraid to hurt you and hurt your feelings. Yeah. And it's like, Why it's super important to be honest. Blah, They're blah, both blah. good people. And, but yeah, yeah we're yeah. still friends. I still yeah. talk to her today. There's nothing bad ever happened. We're, we're still yeah. friends. Um, but with that, I was like, well, I've built my life around your life. Like her, my best friend in Melbourne was her brother. Like, we did everything mm. together. We went to the football together. We went to the horses, you know, the horse yeah. racing together. We went out for drinks to the pub on Friday night together. Like he was my best friend. And when you break up with somebody, you have to, to break that off. And not yeah. having any family or other um, relations around, it was like, why am I living here in Melbourne? Because the initial plan yeah. for starting our business was, I have money and I have expertise and I have a love of travel. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. live in Melbourne and just fly over every three months to mm -hmm. you know, have face-to-face -face strategy meetings and to develop new products and you know do all the things you can do face-to-face. -face. Yeah. I've got financial management experience. You don't need to be locally located to do that. You can do that from wherever. Now, as soon as my relationship broke up, I thought, I love Perth. I love mm -hmm. going there. I've started, a, you know, I'm in the process of a business will launch there within probably two months. Why yeah. am I living in Melbourne? So I packed up my stuff and I moved over here. Mm -hmm. So that was January, 2008, six months after we came up with the idea and within about two weeks of running our first ever public guided walking tour. Yeah. So who came up with the name two feet in a heartbeat? Well, it was me, but by my mom. Um, okay. I, I don't know what you were like in, in high school. I imagine probably similar, but a little bit different in a small town. I was on the SRC or student government. Yeah. Uh, I was on the volleyball team. Uh, I was in the fashion show, you know, there was sport outside of school and all that sort of stuff. And my mom was essentially a, 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 my, my taxi driver. There's no better way to describe <laughs> it. Like she drove me everywhere. Yeah. And there were times where, you know, looking back, I know she was really frustrated with it. Like, Hey, it's, 
Friday night and I want to go walk. I want to go, this is before I could drive, obviously. I want to go and like hang out with my friends and we're going to go wander up and down Albert Street, you know, uh, hanging out in downtown Regina. Uh, oh, whatever. Yeah. Can you drop me off on there? And my mom would say, you know, you've got two feet in a heartbeat, which meant mm. it's called for fuck off. Like, which, which you would never say, but that's yeah. what it meant under the service. Cool. You've got, you've got two perfectly capable legs. So go and walk there. You could do it and you could, yep. you could legitimately do it. So and that's your business um, that and that became, anyone can do what you're doing. You got, you, you, can you move? That's right. Got a yeah, heartbeat, that's right. right? I mean, I've been criticized at some point saying, well, what if you're in a wheelchair or whatever else? But it's like, it's the idea behind it is that, you know, it is that it's all you need is that desire to move, to move around or to have yeah. a look or, you know, and that was actually our tagline for years. It's all you need. You know, yeah. two feet heartbeat, that's all you need. Yeah. Uh, Cause it is, it's quite a simple concept. So yeah. business initially was very, uh, I mean, again, like whole case study for uh, someone who does marketing, you know, we did market mm -hmm. research. We, we thought because we we're both still close to the backpacker generation that yeah. you know, there's gonna be backpackers that were going to want to do our product because they want to meet new people. They want to get yeah. laid, they want free drink. Yeah. Um, it just turned out that economic conditions here dictated. We had a major mining boom going on here at that yeah. time. Huge, huge economic expansion, particularly around construction. Uh, mm -hmm. So there was a shortage of labor here. And all of the backpacker places were filled with people who were doing mm. laboring jobs. It wasn't yeah. travelers. You paid so real money. A, yeah. yeah. Spectacular failure uh, to begin with. Obviously, cool. you know, okay. yeah. you monitor and measure, you, um, uh, you pivot or, you know, I hate that word, but you, you make chain necessary changes and we started target locals and just very quickly the business started to build from running one tour twice per week. Um, you know, at its, at its biggest, uh, uh, now because it's contracted in the last two months has set me back you know I've been around for 13 years and the last mm -hmm. two months probably set me back or last six months has set us back 10 years probably oh, geez. Uh, in yeah. terms of size of the business but yeah. at one point I had a business here two feet and a heartbeat in Perth I had two feet and a heartbeat in Sydney okay. um, you know we had 30 staff uh, we were running hundred we had hundreds of tours available per month between those, uh, cool. those two yeah. cities and yeah, uh, I guess that was the, the real, I guess that was the taste of, uh, you know, building something and it probably important, I think, you know, for me to also say that uh, success, business success doesn't always mean fi financial success. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the two things need to be held in, um, you know, like, I don't think you can judge someone on that financial success is the ultimate, like success in business. Yeah, it's uh, a that, metric. It's a metric. Yeah. It's just one of many, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't want to say I set the world on fire, but it certainly it didn't prevent me from coming home to Canada once per year. Yeah. You know, living a very comfortable lifestyle, not having to want or need for anything, but also didn't, I also haven't, I didn't set the world on fire. You know, it's not like I'm kicking back, retired. No, you know? no but it's such a cool, cool concept. It's so smart. I love it. And I always admired it. And uh, so that's, you know, there you go. That's why I wanted to talk to you about that business and where it came from. So, yeah, like, fuck, I'm podcasting. No one's paying uh, me for this. No, I get uh, yeah, but, but it's, it's, but it's my favorite thing that I'm doing right now, and it's, it's been a blast. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> oh, well, that's so cool. What Can I, else? like, I don't, because uh, I've listened to that was obviously the, there's, like, it's a lot about the person you know, that you're talking to because you're the central figure across the things. But I, I'd just be interested to hear, you know, some other things that are, uh, that like you've done or that are going on that I might, that I might not know about, because I guess that was the one thing, you know, a, a lot of times when you do these things, it's one sided because people are asking you about you, but. Well, I'm interested in people. That's why then I. Yeah. Oh, come on. Right. You know, if I have to, yeah. well, if you, and then like, you know, Megan Taylor, my previous guest, there's no prodding necessary. So yeah. <laughs> it's easy to get it. Yeah, Interesting yeah. things I've done. I don't know. Uh, my jobs have not been very exciting. Although I used to do like uh, communications work with uh, my company and I used to enjoy that. I used to go up to Northern Saskatchewan, we we're a mining company and we go to all these different towns and, and uh, I put together all the communication plans for meeting with Northerners and, that was a blast. It's, it, it's kind of cool because it, it's a different culture up there. But you look for the similarities, right? Like, you know, they're not much different than people from my hometown. Yeah. You know, they, 
the, the accent's different. Sometimes you speak Cree or Dene and you're like, okay, whatever. But um, they're still kind of goofy and, uh, and uh, they have dignity and they may not be educated, but it doesn't mean they're not smart. Yeah. And, and so, you know, when I talk to them or when I develop my communications around that, it's like, treat them like they're not idiots. They don't talk over their heads. So there's a bit of a balance there, right? And yeah. so I had to teach our engineers and our smart people, like, you know, explain what you're talking about. Just not dumb it down, but just, you don't need the jargon. Adapt. No jargon, right? Keep yeah. the jargon out of it, right? And, uh, and uh, if somebody gets up there, he is really mad, maybe they're having a bad day. Or maybe they just want to get something off their chest. And you say, thank you for that. And you move on. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. And uh, I learned a lot f- from doing that. It was great. You have like, uh, you know, you usually get uh, high school kids. They would come out. They would usually get sort of town halls and they would bring out, they'd make the meal for you, pay the school kids because they're raising money. They make us like moose stew or whatever. And uh, yeah, it was I pretty cool. That. Yeah, it was amazing. I went to Uranium City, which is yeah up there and it's a ghost town and it's incredible. There are people that live there though, but it's a town at 5,000 people at its peak and then the mine shut down 1982 or 81, 82. And then within a few years, everybody was gone, but they had like car dealerships and a big rink, brand new rink, yeah. high school. It was booming, booming up there. The mine shut down, boom, they're gone. There's about maybe 80 people that might live there year round. So all these houses, like subdivisions and everything, like it's, it's a town size of Esteban, for example. Like, yeah, okay. You know, but the houses left there and in wintertime, what happens, you know, like with they have basements, heated basements, well, they turn the heat off. What happens is the ground heaves up. Yeah. And then in the springtime, they fall in. So the, the whole town's like covered in these, these, these buildings. But a lot of them, a lot of the nicer places are actually kept by locals and they keep heating them up and they rent them out to exploration people or, Oh, there's a little bit of some people use them as cabins too, or whatever else, and they kind of uh, be around. But it's, it was a really neat place to be up there, and you're very secluded. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can imagine. is there road access up there now, or do you just have to fly I, in still? Ice, ice road, so that's it. Ice so, road, yeah. So they they bring stuff in for about a six week period in February and uh, around February, and and that's it. So and then they used to barge up from Fort McMurray because you could do that because eh? the Athabasca River yeah. goes to Fort McMurray. And, yeah. It's neat with, yeah, they, they go there. So, but they took out the barge landing, so they can't do that anymore. But yeah, it was, I don't know. I've seen parts of Saskatchewan that a lot of people get to see. And North Saskatchewan, yeah. north of PA, it's bigger than area than Germany. Yeah. Like it's a huge it's, area. And there's 30,000 people that live there. Like there's nobody how lives there. How incredibly forested it is. And, you know, it's just an amazing place. Yeah. Um, so I did that kind of stuff for a little while from my work. Yeah, cool. kind of liked it, and now I'm doing security stuff, and I get okay. I get I get interesting stories. I'm not going to share too many of them because like That's okay. sometimes you just kind of sit around, and something happens. You're like, "What the hell happened?" <laughs> and you're the one trying to have to go figure it out. So I have I've had to do some weird investigations and stuff like that. There's a lot a lot of untoward stuff that goes on at our company, but uh, yeah. there's weird stuff that happens, and you're like, "What the hell happened?" So, <laughs> and people always call you. What's going on? Can you help me? I'm like, I don't know. I guess I can help you. I guess I'm the guy. <laughs> Excuse me. Like I said, I'm a generalist. So yeah. I just kind of take on anything. But I really missed uh, my job, though. I don't talk to a lot of people. I really missed that, yeah. which is why I'm doing this. <laughs> doing this whenever I have time to do it. My voice is getting sore, though, I guess. But um, I don't know. We should talk again. That we that's a hell of a that's a hell of a summary of your life, man. Yeah, it's I, sometimes I, I think back like it feels like this is normal, you know, but it's not normal. realize that a lot of people don't don't go and like most of my my friends are still there in in Saskatoon. Like and yeah. there's a part of me that that misses that because I look at the support that they provide for each other's families, you know what I mean? Like Sure. Uh, that, that that they are essentially a family themselves, you know, extended family, sure. Related by blood, that yeah. the way that they operate, and that and to have so many people uh, in one place who who look after another is like you know, especially in today's, there's quite a lot of disconnection 
disconnection now that it's just such a it's just such a great thing to be able to even just pop back into in the law. And that was one of my main motivations to want to be part of this was to feel like you know we're connected again. And you know, I've got to admit, I, I you're you're someone who I interact with a lot on in Facebook, you know, like and click. We have diff some a lot of yeah. different viewpoints, but I like that because it helps me see a better, you know, more rounded uh, version of the world. Well, you're the one that invited me to Facebook, if you don't recall that. Oh, I don't recall that, really? Yeah, you're the okay, first person. Well, I got a few invites, but you're the first one that is, okay, fine, I'll just fucking join this stupid thing. Back when you used to invite people on yeah. Facebook. So you thank you, Facebook. thank you, and go screw yourself. So <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of Facebook trivia. If you look at my, uh, I've only ever had one profile picture. That's this the very first one I started with is the same one that I've still got. Are you now. serious? Yeah, that's beautiful. A bit of a, me a memory thing. My um, my former partner when we moved to Melbourne, um, her brother, and again, just like a. Uh, you know, something that I never would have ex been exposed to in my life. They were from country Victoria, like up on the um, uh, sort of uh, on the border between uh, Victoria and New South Wales, about three and a half hours northwest-ish of, of Melbourne. Yeah. Um, they lived in town. Her dad was the, like, well, the builder in town, you know, build houses and stuff like that. Um, but her brother, like he had a, a, a specifically bred dog for pig hunting. Like it cool. wore like leather armor and they would literally run through the bush. The dog would grab onto it and then he'd run up and slit the pig's throat with a knife, like very um, aggressive stuff. Like, cause yeah. I've never seen anything like it before. <clears throat> Anyways, this his, his, the, the, in, in my profile photo is a retired pig dog. Now oh. he'd sort of just been left, <laughs> he'd just been left with, um, with, with her parents. Um, and you know, like for a dog that did such aggressive stuff, um, yeah. it was just such a beautiful, beautiful animal. So we sort of took him in his retirement and, um, I'm a, I'm a dog lover. Um, I'm an animal lover all, all overall. And, uh, yeah, so he unfortunately passed away, um, pretty much, uh, just after I moved over here, uh, to, to WA. And so as I don't want to say it's an honor, but every time I look at it, I think of him. Uh, so I've just left it up there the whole time. So I've never had. Any I've never other? thought of it before because you just see uh, your avatar. It's a calm looking yeah. avatar. That's what I see it as. Yeah. I just looked at it. Yeah. And it looks nothing like. <laughs> no, exactly. Right. I'm not, I'm, we're, in the, we're in this, we're in one of these like houses that are par that are uh, parents and brother eventually like bulldozed and did it. It was like a crack den. It had like brown velour, like wallpaper, you know, that textured stuff. And it, it was just, it was a shithole. Um, but you know, good memories from there. And I don't know why, why that picture was taken, why I was lying in bed like that. But again, just a random thing tied to our, you know, yeah. that would have been the first thing you would have seen when I invited you to Facebook. My Twitter photo, I started that in 2009. So shortly after Twitter started, I've had the same photo. That photo's from 2006. And I have a shit stash. Do you? Yeah. There. I'm gonna, was, I'm gonna, now I gotta let, look it up. I don't think I. Oh God, I'm barely on Twitter anymore. But thank God. And um, wearing my flames hat, it was that. But I liked it because it was it was looking. I was looking west. It was during the sunset, and I was on the lake in J July of that year on a pontoon boat, and it was just a beautiful night. There I am. <laughs> so I did a, I did a, this stupid thing right there i thought it was just so fucking stupid uh but i like the uh, there's some other pictures of that actually i'm not making a dumb face but I like that one but the, the light was great and uh it does and you know what and that to me i was like, actually playing guitar like on the boat. what's that that doesn't look like that doesn't look like you either no that's like i said 2006 that's 14 years ago yeah. but i'm gonna get like a dumb face too so that's that's what it is but i just kept it i've never changed it i'm never gonna change it yeah don't i don't think <sighs> it is. I, I love it that's hilarious Maybe that's a good time though to to wrap her up, but yeah, for sure. I, I just I really enjoyed your story. You've always been a natural storyteller. I like how, and I know you're doing other stuff. I guess uh, too, like for your business. Do you have other businesses that you're running as well? I, I do. Like you don't have to. You don't have to include this bit if you don't want to. Feel free. No, to it, but, out. but like, it's fine. Whatever you want to. Um, yeah. So look, my, my business Two Feet Harpy really opened a world of other stuff for me. So yeah. Uh, in addition to Two Feet and Heartbeat, um, I have a, a tourism and heritage consultancy. So I do a lot of okay. work for like local government, yeah. uh, other tourism businesses and things like that, where I provide them 
help and advice or I write or I research stuff right. for them. It's an um, extension that's for what you were doing and, and, and you learning as being a tourist yourself. Yeah, that's right. I use my practical experience, but also my business experience, because if you think about a, a local government trying to set up like a commercial enterprise, they don't have the expertise to do that. So they don't know about how to do market research or how to commercialize something. They're oh, not yeah. thinking about it from that angle. Yeah. Um, so again, I'll just give you an example of one that I, that I did. So in 2014, it was the 100 year commemoration of the first soldiers that left from Australia to go to fight in the first world war. Mm -hmm. So here in a place that's five hours south of Perth on the south coast called Albany, um, all of the, uh, with the exception of West Australian soldiers, because they left from here in Perth, but all of the soldiers from New Zealand and Australia gathered in uh, Albany and then sailed off in, on convoy to mm -hmm. Europe and Africa to fight in the mm -hmm. war. So they, the go federal government had like, they built a brand new like commemorative center and like all this sort of stuff. And they had weeks worth, actually four years worth of events. And so the federal government, came to us and said, can you create a whole series of tours and products for down there? So it was the biggest project I'd ever worked on. Sure, it took yeah. like six, six months worth of work to put it all together, but cool. it wasn't mine at the end. It was given to the city and then they could yeah. do whatever they wanted with it. You're consultant, that's what you do, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah, consult. Yep. Um, which is the hardest part of being a consultant because they didn't mm. do anything with it afterwards and it just got, went into a drawer, which is very, <laughs> makes me angry, right? Um, so that's experience so, as well. Yes, that's right. right. Um, so that's gone on and I've been doing that since and I've done stuff before then, but that was the biggest job and that's led to lots of other things. Uh, I do, do stuff for our state government quite regularly uh, yeah. and that's branched out to also doing stuff in the heritage space. So, um, you know, it's about conservation of places through interpretation. So, you know, you've got a place that you've restored and you've spent money on it bricks and mortar style, but what's, yeah. what's the good of it if you don't have the ability to bring people into it and care about it from a from a personal experience you know about the people not just about the physical look of the building but what are the stories behind it so i do a yeah. lot of work in, in that space uh, and i work quite closely with my business partner we have our own individual companies but we collaborate on a lot of stuff like that together yeah um i also uh started up a tourism technology company so i use these like these devices which come from china and this is all about building um additional like sort of get people to spend more money and spend more time when they come into come into our our city uh so it's basically an attractions pass you and the wife and the kids are visiting you know i've eventually after pestering you for 10 years convinced you to uh take a big trip here to to perth mm -hmm. trust me you wouldn't have to worry about knowing what to do i would show you but let's say you no. just didn't know what to do yeah you buy a pass. you're out of town so yeah yeah you buy a pass for you and the kids it's a fixed price um, but then you have a choice of like 40 or 50 things to do in the city. You can pick three of those things. So you just yeah. go scan this thing and it's essentially, you know, we just pay everyone a, a net rate. We're a middleman. Uh, okay. Yeah. Use technology to make it easier for people. Uh, yeah. The problem with this one is uh, this business launched uh, in March. So about three days before <laughs> everything shut down, our market's Not, almost exclusively to hear that. national customers. Uh, so it's just in hibernation. Well, these things happen. I mean, yeah. not this thing, but things happen. Well, so. summer's coming up though, like you said though, right? It's, it's, yeah, uh, but we're closed. No one, no one can come here. Right. From outside the state. Yeah. 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 So it's useless at the moment. So it's okay. I mean, that's just, that, that stuff happens. Life, man. Yeah. And then actually, you know, about hopefully just before Christmas, I have the biggest project I've ever been involved with. Um, it's, it's only recently been publicly announced, uh, but I've been working on it for two years, like crazy. And this is, um, I'll call it a public-private partnership because um, we are working closely with the state government and it'll be operating on a state government asset, although we'll, we're, we'll be a fully commercial business uh, in the background. So they built a brand new football here. The Australian rules football is the hockey of, of Canada. Yeah. In the southern part of Australia, Aussie rules, rules. Yeah. Um, and they build a brand new, we have a billion dollar stadium. It was voted Ooh. as the world's be most beautiful stadium. And it is incredible. It's, it's, there's no Jesus. other way to describe it. Holy it's fucking Christ. awesome. Like it's, it's amazing. And they built this amazing pedestrian bridge that connects the Eastern part of the city across our beautiful Swan river to the stadium precinct. If I walked from where I live here, I live pretty much downtown, um, it would be maybe 30 minutes to walk. So it's not very far. It's right in the heart of the city. Yeah. Um, and they built this beautiful bridge. It's like a black swan and a white swan together. I'll send you some photos. They'll eventually be spamming everyone online anyway, because I'll be going to announce it. You know, you've got to use my personal network to promote it to the world. Um, 
and so what we're going to be doing is we're going to have a bridge climb that goes up and over the top. Uh, and it's pretty technical. It's like a, it's steepest is about 47 degrees is the angle. So it's like climbing a ladder in most yeah. cases. It's got a glass floor, like sky view platform, it's called. And then we've got a zip line that goes over from the bridge across the river wow. and onto the mainland. You'll be able to go, we've calculated, the physics tell us um, that with appropriate wind and stuff like that, you'll be able to travel up to about 100K an hour on the, on the zip line. It's going to be <laughs> exciting, like adrenaline rush type, type stuff. Right. So... That's the biggest project I've ever been involved with. Couldn't be, I mean, some people might say it's the worst timing of all, but really uh, to launch a brand new exciting tourism product when you only have locals, hopefully people will, will embrace it. Uh, because at the moment we really, you know, and around the globe, it's the same in other places. If you can't go somewhere, hey, there are people out there. And even in Saskatoon, like, you know, I, I was thinking about, I did um, a tour. I've done it a couple of times since I've been there. I think it's called Eco Glide or something like that. They've got like Segway things and they do a, a yeah. tour around the river. And I was thinking, man, they did a great job. Both times I've gone on there, what was summer like for them? Like were locals going out and doing that sort of stuff? Yeah. I hope mm -hmm. that was the case because here, you know, there are businesses well. that, you know, are intentionally set up to focus just on the international market because they've got different requirements um, that they're not going to see any business here potentially into t until 2022. Like, how could a business survive? It just, it's not possible. So I, don't know, I went, I went to a hotel last couple nights. I just got back today. I did a staycation with the family. Went water sliding, right. went downtown. Oh, what, what? Water sliding. Not enough yeah. of that here, considering how awesome the weather is. I don't, it was awesome. Well, it's great for the indoor water slides and it was nice. It was just, yeah. took the kids out of school and that's our little vacation. That's what we did. So, yeah, um, great. Yeah, I think there is a market there. I think you just got to remind people. And like a restaurant, like I mentioned before, like a restaurants are open, but people aren't filling up even the the minimum or the maximum space. Like people aren't doing yeah. that. And it's like, oh, come on, guys. Go out now. Enjoy yourself. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it, if anything, it's shown uh, the, the probably the overall flaw in, in like a purely globalist view of the world. You know, there has to be, yeah. you know, the stage thing. We need a a local network connected to an interstate or interprovincial network connected, created, connected to a global network. And all three of those things have to have benefits flowing in both directions. Yeah. Otherwise it doesn't work. And, you know, just looking here from a tourism perspective, um, you know, thankfully, you know, we, in order to grow our business, the way, the only way to do that was to grow internationally. And now that's all been chopped off about if you were to calculate interstate. So outside of Western Australia and international, it's between 75 and 80% of my business came mm -hmm. from those things and now okay. that that's closed there is very little i can do to you know i might be able to pick up bits and pieces but i'm not going to be able to grow it back to you know even 50 percent uh you know because that's just not that there's just not that amount available right yeah so, but you can you know, but you could focus on these little these off these other gigs that you're working on too and and work somewhere kind of get ready it, it, it's going to pick up someday oh, it will well. And then you're going to maybe find a ways to do a little simpler or a little uh, more efficiently or, or whatever it is. You've just, you got to keep working at it. And then when it comes, just, just, just go for it. Who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, 2022. Working toward, yeah. Working towards the end game is just trying to have more time to be able to come back to Canada. I'd love, cause they've changed all the immigration rules now. I'd love to be able to get Candace a um, Canadian passport. Yeah. Guess that it's like, two at least two out of a five-year window in canada or something like that if you're mm. if you're not currently a, a resident to be able to do that and so thinking about that right now number one i don't know how she'd go in the winter time she gets cold here in the winter so um when don't we were there <laughs> we celebrated our engagement and we were there around and i guess i shouldn't have been surprised because we were there around this time it would have been maybe three years ago yeah yeah yeah, it was because they all the reminders are coming up. It'll be in a couple of days. It'll be next uh, weekend or the weekend after. Um, and yeah, yeah. we had a big party at Gerhardt's. We had everyone around in the basement over at Jeff Gerhardt's. And that night it was minus 39 degrees <laughs> like, in October. It yeah, like, it can get cold. Like, yes, it can. Reminder yeah. number one. June to like, August. Like, June to <laughs> August. Don't go beyond that. Don't, yeah. don't go outside that and try to hit August if you can. But yeah. Well, shit, man. This has been great. Um, Definitely. If you so, want to do a follow-up or uh, yeah. even just a normal catch-up, you and me, I'd definitely be down with that because I, I really yes. did enjoy this. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that in a few months here. Let's catch up a little bit about, like, like per, you know, 
how's day to day stuff. But yeah. uh, that was really cool. It's such a cool, and I've been talking to a lot of entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, and I think I'm, I don't know why I'm doing that, but I'm learning a lot of really cool things that my friends are doing. And uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with it all, but I'm doing something with it. Well, I'm going to write a book about it, I think. Okay. And well, uh, let, me, let me know if I can contribute anything else. Uh, I'm I'll, always interested in what other people, I mean, I really do like what other people do. And yeah, this is, this is gold. As oh, far you've, as contrib- you've contributed. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to be a two part podcast. Sorry. <laughs> it's good. I can split it up. Uh, I just, I'm thinking if it turns out to be like, cause what was the, the longest one I think I listened to? It was, was, it, was it the second one or maybe it was like so how to, one one hour 23 or something like that maybe it was i can't remember but yeah it was a little bit longer and i Me knew and I, Bell, I, I, yeah. I was getting a bit of fatigue maybe because i didn't know the person yeah it was interesting but um you know like the one for with brad peterson felt like because i knew him it felt like it went by in a flash i'll have to well, also him. yeah yeah we cut, we actually cut some stuff out of there too a little bit too because we were he's like he wasn't feeling feeling comfortable talking about a few things oh, okay <laughs> okay fine so, yeah, but fair uh, I'm just looking at it right now. The one I did last, yeah, you know, with Meek, so that was the longest one. But you, you exceeded it by by a uh, huge margin. But I don't care. And if people, <laughs> if anyone's still listening, thank you. You guys are wonderful. But um, they're not all going to be like that. This is my podcast. We do whatever I want, you and can. I'm really enjoying it. But we will reconnect again shortly uh in the next uh, few months maybe around christmas time or something like that uh, that'd be great we have awesome. time eh? i promise that uh next time we'll we'll do something together next time <laughs> we'll have i think we should shoot for a much broader catch-up because it was funny just the other day kendall pierce sent me a message and oh, we've yeah. just been we've just been chatting like in a thing and it, like he was he wasn't maybe my closest friend or even in it's a great like, guy though life. yeah exactly and yeah. i hadn't thought about catching up with him he's not someone i thought i would call when i would go to saskatoon now i think i'm just going to throw the world and go look let's have a big ripper of a catch up kids and everyone welcome unless you don't want to bring your kids um and uh let's just let's just get everyone together for like a big res and uni university reunion uh when we can travel home next summer or whenever that is i would just think it would be super fun and we'd get a, a really broad range of people together uh, face-to-face maybe you can do some that's a hall interviews or something or, like that there as well yeah yeah i like so that idea. Uh, what do they call them vox pops oh i'm loving it i'm loving the idea okay we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna work on that later okay <laughs> all right good talking to I you did. have a great night good luck thank good you for this you well. and we'll be in touch shortly okay <laughs> yeah awesome man <laughs>